You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And obviously, they'd say that he's coming to visit Epstein. It would flag up. It would say, but he's a convicted felon. You do know that. And they'd go back to Rory and they'd say, uh, yeah, yeah, um, sir, do you do know? And he's it, obviously gone, I'm going. He's obviously gone against advice for whatever reason that is. As I said, having read stuff and having been briefed on what had happened to a kid and what they did to him, and being in front of the kid and seeing the state of him. And I'm starting looking and I'm thinking, shit. My colleague was downstairs, so I was by this uh, exit door and he was down the next floor to stop anyone coming up and coming in and obviously being faced with this situation. So the noise we heard when we were looking through the window, it was scuffling, it was him on the floor tied up. You're fucking dangerous. You, you're, you know, you're a child molester and you're standing there and you're laughing, you think you're fucking funny. Because basically, if the maids don't put the teddy bears back exactly like this is in that picture, he goes into one, he flips. Was he the favourite? Yeah. I mean, he got away with absolute fucking murder. I mean, you know, we were letting people in, we didn't know who the fuck they were. And uh, if we said anything, we'd get told, shut up. I'm doing it because people should know what Prince Andrew's like. And I'll bear my soul and, I'll, and I'll, there's more to come about what I've done. So Rob Protection, a lot of the officers had a massive dislike for Prince Charles because they blamed him for her death. I just think the issue you've got with Prince Andrew and what he's got is six or seven of his closest friends are convicted, now convicted sex offenders. Boom, we're on. Today's guest, we've got Paul Page. Paul, nice how are you, brother? Good, Good to see you. Yeah. Seen a few of your interviews. Yeah. 60 Minutes in Australia, mm. uh, Lad Bible, that mm. you've worked close with the royalties, you've been mm. very outspoken against big names such as Prince Andrew, yeah. we've all seen his interview, bit embarrassing if I'm honest, but yeah. before we get into all the mad stuff, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, yeah, good. I've been busy, as you know, um, mm. finished an interview with NBC last year, that went at uh, Peacock TV America, mm -hmm. uh, obviously talking about Prince Andrew. Um, and done a few other things. I've turned down quite a bit of stuff because I don't want to be someone bouncing around the scene. I've, I've said what I've said because it's true. Um, and um, it's the more people that that sort of understand what the man is about, Prince Andrew, the more they can make an in informed decision of, you know, what he's actually done or what he's suspected of having mm -hmm. done. Before we get into everything, Paul, just get a bit of understanding about you, what you've done yeah. in the past, what you're yeah. involved in. Yeah. Um, so I always like to go back to the start of my guess, mm. where you grew up, how it all began. Uh, East London, uh, not Essex as some people call me an Essex wide boy. I'm from East London, Leightonstone, born in Forest Gate. Um, stayed there most of my life, well, up until 20 when I joined Essex Police um, and then moved to Grays. In fact, <laughs> my uh, sergeant, duties, beat duty sergeant, uh, welcomed me to the police station. He said, welcome to Grays, the arsehole of Essex. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it was, uh, it was that, that's where I first was based, Essex. I uh, was there for about three years. What were you like at school? I wasn't, I wasn't massively clever. I, you know, I, I was street smart. Um, I got an old level in English and art, but I wasn't really that academic. I was more sports orientated. Um, I uh, <clears throat> I started karate when I was eight. I uh, got my black belt when I was fourteen, and then got into the England karate team when I was sixteen. So I spent a lot of my sort of younger days travelling up and down the country and across Europe, uh, fighting in competitions, um, winning. You know, I won quite a bit. Um, I wasn't the best of the best, and I won the British and English titles. Uh, never, never got a European or world uh, title, unfortunately. Um, but I just didn't have that extra as some of my friends did, went on to be world champions. I just didn't have, didn't have that extra push. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it gave me discipline, gave me focus. Um, it sort of instilled into me um, that you've got to work hard, you know, harder than you've ever worked before if you really want something. You can't get carried along. Um, you've got to do it yourself. You know? Otherwise, you're never going to go anywhere. Yeah. How was your family upbringing? Um, I lived with my, I was brought up by my grandparents because my parents were having problems at the time. Um, so I was fostered by those. Um, luckily for me, they were quite well, well off. Um, so I didn't want for anything, you know, as soon as I passed my test, uh, I, was, I had a brand new car. Um, I wasn't spoiled, but I was looked after um, by my grandparents. Um, he had a 
building business, quite a successful business. Um, and um, yeah, so I suppose he put me in for everything, you know, to try to keep me busy. So Cubs, Scouts, got my Chief Scouts Award, uh, Territorial Army, um, served three years in that from the age of 17 to 20 before I went to the police. Uh, worked as a lifeguard, a fitness instructor, and obviously England Karate International. So uh, I was quite busy for mm -hmm. my younger days. I wasn't a saint, don't get me wrong. I've been chased by the fucking police. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I've just never been caught. Uh, but not doing any serious crime, but just being a little shit like yeah. most people are. Do you think keeping busy then kind of helps with the family breakup? Yeah, I think that's why my, um, my grandparents... Uh, did so much for me to try and cover that gap that I never really had a, uh, you know, a normal relationship as my friends did. They lived with their parents and I was an only child. Um, and so they did their best. But so I had an, an old school upbringing, you know, old fashioned sort of views that I took on, you know, and, um, and it didn't do me any harm, you know, mm -hmm. but it gave me the drive to succeed. It gave me, you know, my grandparents always said, you know, no one's going to give anything in this life. You've got to work hard for it. And that's the, that's the ethics that I had at the time. And I wanted to be a millionaire. That is what I wanted, uh, to be a millionaire. Um, and I was going to achieve that some way. Um, so, but I wasn't a businessman. I wasn't a builder. I didn't have those sort of qualities, you know, to, to be able to start, you know, uh, designing stuff like my grand, grandfather could. Um, and like I said, I was more fitness and sports orientated. But what happened one, one time when I was in the Territorial Army, a friend of mine, he was only 18, um, and I knew his girlfriend because she worked in the same leisure centre as me. Um, they, were in a, they were in a club, we had a fight with somebody, um, and he got stabbed to death. Um, I think that was pretty tough. But then we were doing the funeral, the, the, the sort of the unit was going to carry the coffin in full uniform, and we had to practice with this coffin. And I just couldn't do it. I just, I thought, nah. I didn't even go to the funeral, um, which I'm sorry about now. But, but yeah, that really, that was the first sort of, uh, well, it's the second incident I had, you know, to do with close person dying. Um, when I was six, my, my, my grandfather's brother lived with us. Um, and I found him, I was, I think, about six or seven, and I found him dead. Um, but I didn't really understand about dying, I just knew he was laying on the floor and he wasn't moving and I was talking to him and I went downstairs um, and he, he died of a heart attack. So that, that sort of, and then this happened and um, you just think, fucking hell, life's too short. Um, and I started looking around thinking, what do I want to do? And I initially uh, wanted to be a fireman, but they weren't recruiting at the time. So I thought, oh, fuck it, I'll try the old bill. And uh, the Met weren't recruiting, Essex was. Um, so I applied for Essex Police. And, um, and got in. What sort of training did you have to do to get into the coppers? I think I did 20 weeks. I did it at a, um, uh, a, uh, in two seconds, I'll get it right in a minute. Shotley Police Training School, which is in Suffolk. So it's like a county training facility for Essex, Cambridge, uh, Norfolk Constabulary. So a, amalgamation of different forces mm. used that training school. So it wasn't Hendon. Um, and that was, uh, you know, that was uh, pretty comprehensive. I think we did 10 weeks in the school and then we came out for five weeks to our police stations and went on patrol with our beat officers that were going to teach us. Um, so it was pretty intense. Um, what year was that? That was 92. Yeah, 1992. Oh, nearly 30, nearly 30 years ago. Yeah. yeah. All right, calm down. Am I showing your age, Paul? <laughs> showing your yeah. age. But, um, but... Yeah, I mean, it was it was uh, it was an eye opener. Um, you know, the, the training was, as I say, the training was good, but it's it's you can't you have to go on the streets to learn your trade. At the end of the day, mm. you can do all the scenarios you want, um, but you know how they're going to end up because it's practice. It's different when you're on the streets. What was the first thing you'd seen as a copper? In my first year, I was nearly shot. Um, I had to guard a, a horribly mutilated body um, and I got assaulted. Um, so those three things sort of were a steep learning curve. So nearly being shot, basically we were on night duty and um, we're all in the station. No one, no one gone out, all sitting around doing fuck all basically. 
And then the phone rings. Someone says, all oh, right, okay, yeah, put the phone down. What's the matter? He said, oh, someone's wrecked their gunshots. Said, Fuck it. No, nah, that's probably fireworks. Then another call. Yeah, I think I've heard gunshots. And then another one, we think, ah, right, okay, maybe we better go and have a look at this. So I was driving the duty inspector at the time. So we went to these uh, block of flats in Grays, Conway Gardens, and um, all the lights were off. But the ground floor flat, flat uh, next to the entrance, the window was smashed and it was in darkness. So we went up, did, just looked, looked, couldn't see anything, heard a little noise, we thought, and we buzzed one of the other neighbours to let us through the door. So as you go in the door, this door to the flats is directly on your left. So we knocked quietly on the door, nothing, looked through the letterbox, and we both looked through the letterbox, and we just heard a ch -ch -ch, like we knew what it was straight away, you know, and uh, we just both ran, pushing each other out of the way. It was every man for himself. We were shoving each other. I didn't give a fuck that he had pips on his shoulders. I wasn't getting shot. And we just ran. We ran health for leather back to the car, hid behind the car, called up for assistance. Um, and it turns out that the fella had just been released from South End Police Station. It was a domestic incident. He'd, he'd been released. He'd gone home, picked up a shotgun and a pistol. Um, nasty bit of work. Um, and he'd come back to his girlfriend's flat where she was there with a six-year-old child and her brother. He'd shot the window out, climbed through, beat the brother up, tied him up on the floor. So the noise we heard when we were looking through the window, it was scuffling. It was him on the floor tied up. And um, anyway... Firearms teams and negotiators turned up, tried to try to talk him out. He's ended up going in the bathroom with the girlfriend and the, his child and just blew his head off. Um, I remember going in there and it was just, it, it was the blood was everywhere. And the weird thing was the girl didn't have any blood on her. Just, just completely clean. How do you deal with that, the aftermath? Do you I mean, still struggle with that? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I don't know how... I, it's really difficult because you know I know at the, at the current climate no one likes the old bill and there's a lot of shit coming out and, and these people rightly so should be persecuted for, for what they've done you know I'm, we'll talk about stuff that I've done and you know um, but that being in that kind of environment being in that job it doesn't matter who you are people sitting there listening to me go and join the police and see what it's like for yourself you can sit there and judge people like me but unless you've been there and you've you've been in situations like I'm going to describe for you then you just need to take it on board it's not, life's not a bowl of cherries. You know, people don't play, play straight. You know, in that situation now, I didn't think about it at the time. I was more concerned about the, the kids and the one we got, I mean, we went in after it was all clear, what they were taken away. Um, and then the, the, I remember them saying that they'd, he'd lost so much blood, they had trouble back in the mortuary trying to take blood samples out of him. Um, and then when they obviously they lifted him over, they found the pistol stuffed down his trousers. And I thought at the time, Fucking hell, he could have just shot as soon as we knocked on the door. We shouldn't have knocked on the fucking door. Mm -hmm. He could have just gone bang and we'd have both been shot dead. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, since I've been doing these podcasts over the last five years, like, I wasn't anti authority because I wasn't that bad, but mm -hmm. I used to go, oh, fuck the police. But yeah. then when you actually speak to them, like undercover coppers and yeah. the strain, under, yeah. undercover paedophile, the guy went 20 years yeah. working the world's darkest job, I believe. The strain and the stress that they go through and the things that you yeah. see, the horrors, trying to do I mean, the right thing. Listen, there's good yeah. and bad everywhere. I always yeah, say this stuff, but yeah. Yeah. to people who do that job, and because I know the majority of coppers now are mm. turning to alcohol or drugs to mm. be, to mm. black out the pain, because yeah. what they see, there's not enough things in place to help them for the trauma mm. that they see. PTSD would probably see worse things in the place oh. than some people do in the army. I mean, like, 30 years ago, there was not much about it. and I, you know there was colleagues around me that did have mental health issues and actually had breakdowns a sergeant who was a good good copper he just he just lost the plot uh pc same thing um and um you know i remember the first i mean, that was one incident but the first incident uh that i was faced with death was um we had a call to a, a, a washing powder factory um that uh, a man had committed suicide in the factory on the floor of the factory so again, I was with my inspector. So we went down there. His colleagues were traumatized. Obviously, they've walked in. Imagine the scene. It was like a, you know, like a coal train. They've got them them carriages. It's sort of like that, and it was going around in a circle. But it, at each sort of station, there was a there was a, a shaft that pumped powder into the things, and it just kept going. And if you see what I mean, to, to make the to make the the whatever it is, the powder. And as we've walked in, this 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 sort of train thing is 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 stopped, but there's still a lot loud noise in the place. And as we looked on the floor, there was a headless corpse on the floor, um, and it just looked like a fucking dummy. 
that was my, you know what I mean? I was like, shit. Um, and I'm trying to stay focused and listening to what's going on, but I'm staring at this body thinking, is that fucking real? Because it just didn't look real. Because the shock mm -hmm. took over. You know, I mean, I didn't throw up. I wasn't sort of physically sick, but mentally I was like, so uh, we had to secure the scene because we didn't know what had happened at the time. Um, so I was tasked with guarding this body on my own. Um, and of course, then there's no one in this big fucking warehouse that just sit for me in this, in this body uh, and loud noise. And I'm starting looking and I'm thinking, shit. My colleague was downstairs, so I was by this uh, exit door and he was down the next floor to stop anyone coming up and coming in and obviously being faced with this situation. All of a sudden, a, a loud voice comes out of this body. Like, blah, blah. So I can't even remember because I was so frightened, I just fucking run. I kicked through the door, I went, ran downstairs, I went, there's something going on, you need to get the fuck up there. I panicked, so I just lost the plot. So he came back up and what had happened was, he's got a radio on him and someone downstairs was using the radio. But because I was focused on this body and things were going through my head, I didn't, wasn't thinking like practically. And, um, and I got the piss taken at me for that badly. You know, I, I, was, I was torn to pieces when I went back to the net. But the worst thing was, <laughs> the worst thing was because I'd reacted like that, obviously he's gone on the way and said, oh, Paige, he's fucking shit himself, blah, blah. Where to find the head? So they made me go and look for the head and climb up on the wooden machinery. They turned it all off. And I found this, this poor fella's head. And it was resting on this piece of machinery, which was staring at me, his eyes open. Um, so I said, look, I, I, you know, I found, I found the, you know, the head. Um, so Soko came down and back in them days, I mean, Soko now, scenes of crime officers, they're mainly civilians. Um, but back then it was like detectives, DCs and detective sergeants. <laughs> and this old sweat come along and he's taking pictures of the scene. Ambulance had been and obviously confirmed death, obviously. So he was waiting for the mortuary people to arrive. And he said to me, right, son, get up there and get that head down. I went, sorry? He goes, you're going to have to get the head down. He goes, we, we need to get the head. I said, I'm not touching that. Um, and they were, again, I, I said, no, I'm not. That was, that, was, that was a step too far. So I knew that I didn't do it, but the head was recovered. Um, but then I started thinking about who this person was. And this is where it gets you. Because it's all right dealing with a horrific scene, but then you start to think, oh, fuck, he had a wife. He's had family. What are they going to think? You know what I mean? And then that's what hits you. You start thinking about the people that are left behind and the situation that, that, that that's occurred. Now, I never never got to find out whether or not it was an accident or whether he committed suicide. What I do know is he'd only just come back off of, of a t Jamaican holiday, two-week holiday. So he's in hol still in holiday mode, but now his wife's faced with being told that her husband's never going to come home again. Mm -hmm. So the situations when you're dealing with them, you can deal with them at the time, but like you just said, it's, it's up here when, it's, when that starts to affect that is when you start to go off paste. And you can be as impartial as you want, and a police officer can come and go and say, well, it's one it's part of the job. Well, it might be part of the job, but it still affects normal people. If you're not affected, you're fucking nuts. It's, sorry, yeah. it's as simple as that. How hard is it going to see families and tell them that they've lost loved ones? I've only ever been there once, luckily. Um, well, I say luckily. Uh, it wasn't, it was a road accident, victim of a road accident. I think he was about 20. And um, usually traffic do, but on this occasion we, we did it. Um, and it was horrific. It was absolutely horrific. People know as soon as I'm doing police officers are standing there, it's either two things, someone's been nicked or someone's dead. Or, you know, that's what people usually think. And um, yeah, it was not, not a good place to be. Those kind of jobs are, you've got to be solid. And if, it, you know, because if you start being affected in front of these people, it's going to make things 10 times worse. So, yeah, um, that was a very unpleasant situation for me. I can deal with the blood and gore, but it's the, it's the surrounding, it's the effects outside that that I was always sort of mm -hmm. thinking about. Um, but, yeah, like I said, the, back then, there wasn't, you couldn't go in and go, oh, I'm feeling a bit low. Or that. They'd go, what the fuck are you talking about? That's the job. Get on with it. You know, that's how it was. Mm -hmm. um, there wasn't all this, and I'm going to say touchy, touchy, feely, feely, but... There are people out there that need help. And back then, you know, it's like back in the 90s, it's, society changes over the years, doesn't it? Yeah. So what was acceptable back then is definitely not acceptable now. 
in terms of policing, in terms of social, you know, activities of what people do and who people want to express themselves as they want to express themselves. So back then, there's a lot of people that that didn't have the help that they needed. And like I said, I um I, I knew probably when I went to Marylebone, another couple of people had mental issues. Um, and one was found un carrying underneath his fucking table in his front wheel because he never reported for duty. Loads of paperwork because the paperwork got to him. They couldn't control the paperwork and he just kept taking it home and hiding it, hiding it, and in the end he lost the plot. Um, the worst one was uh, a good friend of mine, um, Boise's nickname was, at Royal Protection. I'm going to say Boise, I'm, I'm not going to hide who he is, but I'm not going to say his real name, but everyone knows who worked with me, who it was. And he was such a funny bloke. Such a funny bloke. He was the laugh and soul of the party. But when he came to royalty, he had a couple of weeks off, um, and I think they said he was it was depression or something like that. Um, we didn't really think too much of it. We thought, hmm, mm, we thought, right. So we didn't know him at the time. We're thinking, right, he's got suffering from depression or stress or something, and they've given him a fucking gun. Is that is that you know is that right? But when he came up. You wouldn't, you wouldn't, like most people with depression, it doesn't show on the outside, it's on the inside. You could be the funniest fucker ever, but inside you're dying. Mm -hmm. And this is what this, this is what he was like. He was the life and soul of the party. He clicked straight away as soon as he came on, on the unit, which was a clicky unit. You know, if you was a knobhead, you're, you're going. <laughs> it's as simple as that. But he was so funny. Um, but inside he was, he was in pain. Um, and he transferred to Windsor Castle. Um, and then I think someone told me he, on New Year's Eve, his family went out for a party, he didn't go. He went down the end of the shed and killed himself with a shotgun. Um, and you think, fucking hell, he was, he was, we thought he was all right. You know, it was a nice bloke. So you can never tell who's got what issues. You know what I mean? Um, he was, he was obviously suffering, but he used to, he used to make people laugh. So although he was dying inside, he was making people laugh. He killed himself in his own shed or the ones yeah, that no, went his own shed. No, his own shed. Yeah, so that, I think his you, family found him. Yeah. Do you not get mental health tests before you're working with <sighs> some of the royal family? Well, um, Could he not have potentially turned on one of the family? Well, you, listen, um, you know, I'm, I, I, I've, I was hurt when when I got um, when I got arrested and, and my wife was put in the door. I was hurt. You know, I, I got to the stage we'll go for it. I thought I was above the law. You know, I, I turned corrupt. I corrupted police officers. I corrupted civilians through the need to get my money back um you know and i'll sort of go through that but at the end of the day with, with like mental tests i don't know what it's like now but back then there was no sort of you don't sit down beside car chips it was your eye test your fitness test um hearing test and your firearms test they all had to be checked every three months or whatever it was and if you failed any of those you can't carry a gun as for individuals within the unit there were a few people i did think why the fuck has he got a gun you know what I mean? It shouldn't be let loose with a fucking pencil sharpener, let alone a gun. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, some people had attitudes. Some people were rude. I've always been of the opinion that treat people like, as, as most people do, treat people like you want to be treated yourself. Your attitude affects my attitude, affects your attitude. Do you know what I mean? So if I come in strong with you, you're going to get the ump and think, well, why are you talking to me like that for? You don't have to be like that. You Just be normal with people. A couple of fellas, one bloke, his nickname was Harry the Bastard. <laughs> I mean, that tells you, it tells, tells you, oh, it was fucking embarrassing, you know. We'd stand on post, and basically your job is to let people in and out of the palace securely, protect the royal family, obviously, and make sure you, you keep the integrity of the palace secure. The security of the palace is 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 bang on, but you also got tourists coming up to you every every five minutes wanting photographs. I mean, you, you, the, it was it was funny at first, but after the fucking ten thousand ten thousandth one, you're fucking like, oh mate. But you still do it. You still do it because why should you? You know, I know you, people say, oh, the numpty is on the gates. No, no, no. We're all seasoned coppers. We've been there, seen it, done it. We've chose to come to this business for all our own reasons. But they're members of the public. They're tourists. They've come to see a site. Why spoil it for them and be rude to them? You don't need to do that. And some people did were like that. And I used to hate working with them because it's embarrassing. Do you know what I mean? Mm. You think, don't talk to people like that. I can't start referencing a colleague in front of people. Yeah. And, and yeah, you've got some, some fucking oddballs that did work up. I'll be honest with you. I'm not going to lie. So how did you end up involved with working with the royal family? Uh, okay, so um, I was at Marylebone, um, and I suppose maybe we should just start off from Essex and how, what happened, you know, how I progressed into the Met. So in Essex, we're going to go down the road of now, you know, there's two types of corruption. 
You know, I credit Michael Gillard for what I'm about to say now because it's in his book, The Untouchables, was about the anti-corruption command. Um, but there's two types of corruption. There's bent for self and there's bent for the job. I don't know if you've ever read them terms. No, can you explain them? Okay, so bent for self is corruption, in corruption terms, is a copper who's, who's out for himself, who's liaising with criminals, uh, who's doing it when you go and do a raid, he's having after, after coke away or after money away, um, stuff like that, yeah? Selling information to criminals um, for personal gain, yeah? Bent, bent for the job is noble cause corruption, which back in the 90s, Paul Condom even said publicly, look, police officers are getting pissed off with the courts not putting proper sentences, giving proper sentences to criminals. So they're, they're getting out when they should be getting jail and they're, you know, carrying on what they were doing. They we're wasting their time. So police officers would bridge the gap with evidence. For example, if you know someone's bang at it and they're a fucking nuisance on your patch and you see them out at two in the morning, right, a burglar, and you're watching them and they're not really doing anything, they're hovering around, they're looking for an opportunity. Well, I've just seen you fucking try and open that window. Yeah, you haven't been for attempted burglary or make make a false statement basically of assault on police or whatever. That's that's what happens. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so you're 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 bending the rules um, to sort of uh, I don't know scoop wrong ones up. You want to call it that? You know they're at no good, but you can't prove it at the time, or you, so you suspect. Let's say it like that way. I mean, this fella could have done ten burglaries, but he could be walking walking home from a night on the piss. You don't know. But that's that's sort of you know examples i mean i got myself um and as i said to you about um i uh, i dealt with a situation it was a kid 14 15 and we got called to gray's railway station and he was laying on the tracks laying next to the tracks he was pissed he was off his head so we scooped him up and he was oh, i fucking want to die oh, i was 15 he was only a kid saying, what the fuck's the matter with him and he was a right little shit um, we got him up and he was fighting and he was this and he was that. So we got him back. So get in the fucking car. We'll take him back to the police station, call the social services. And um, anyway, they came out and um, it turned. Well, they didn't say anything at the time. The next night, he's back again. He's fucking causing mayhem, nicking stuff out of 7 Eleven, running down the road, frying bottles. It was like being a right fucking nuisance. So um, anyway, we scooped him up again. And um, I thought, what are we resting for? A breach of the pace or something, just to get him off the fucking street. I called the social service again. Look, what the fuck's going on with this kid? And they sat us down and said, listen, his dad was a member of a paedophile ring that murdered a kid. And he's in jail now. But what happened was they'd passed this poor lad. He'd passed, the dad had passed the kid around to all his mates. Um, he was subjected, subjected to horrific abuse. And that was fucking horrible. When I heard that was the first sort of, excuse me, let's cut that bit out. That was the first time I come across an actual victim of a sex crime, you know, rolling around on the streets with piss heads and all the rest. Of it. That's that's one thing, but when you're now faced with the reality of how evil people can be, like really evil to children, it's, it fucks with your head. So, in the police, you're 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 sworn to the you know your your loyalty to the queen and country, and you you swear you're that you're going to protect life and property. You know what I mean? And you're, and you're going to be impartial no matter what, you're going to be impartial. Well, unfortunately for me, I wasn't strong enough to be impartial and I deviated from the fucking script. So once, once sort of, um, I got involved with this boy, and we did, every time we get called out to Nick and I say, we'd say, no, when did it? When, uh, they were nicking from seven, we'd just square the shopkeeper away. We're not nicking him anymore. We're trying to look after him. And, um, and then we started identifying sex cases and paedophiles um, that are on our patch. And um, I remember, I remember one incident where we were called to a school, and this dirty fucker had um, passed a note through the fence to a nine-year-old child, and it basically said what he wanted to do to her and what he wanted her to do to him downstairs and all that shit. Do you know what I mean? Um, and I just thought, you fucking dirty cunt. Um, next time I saw him, I saw him in Grey's Eye Street on a night duty, and I was on foot patrol, so I see him hovering around. And I just went up to him and went, went, come here, you. And he went, what's the matter? I went, would you say me? Tell me the fuck off you pig, did you? And I just fucking threw him on the floor. Uh, court said, you're arrested on, 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 for assault on place. I fucking made it up. I did. I'll be honest with you. Um, and um, I'd read his, I'd read his uh, collator's card before that and the things that he'd done, the, 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 the acts that he committed. And I felt physically fucking sick. Um, and I was faced with this piece of shit. I couldn't help myself. I needed to put it, lock him up. 
So I called the van up, put him in the back of the van, and um, he had a clump. Um, and then we arrested him. And we took him back to the police station and uh, charged him uh, just with Section 4. We didn't go with Sorton Police, Section 4, public order. And got him off. The, I said, that's him. He's locked away now, so fuck him. And then it wasn't all the time, but every now and again when we came across sick individuals, um, another one, another one, he was a fucking horrible. I mean, when I read his sheet, it was just as bad as the other ones. I mean, there's standards in life, isn't there? An ordinary human being does not do these things. So therefore, in my eyes, that every time I see these people, they've got to be terrorised. They've got to be fucking, I'm watching you. You know, it wasn't always getting a clump, but it was like, I'm watching you. Where the fuck are you going? Make sure they're, they're on their toes. Do you know what I mean? They're, 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 if they're going to do anything, they're going to be looking, man, they're going to be fucking having to think hard and fast if they're going to do it or not. I mean, the old saying, we used to beat them up, stitch them up and lock them up. Um, and I'm not sorry for that. I'm not sorry for what I did. Um, on the other side of the coin, I, you know, I didn't subject people to police brutality. Um, I think as a police officer, the most important asset you've got is your gob. Yeah. So if you're dealing with people on a day-to-day -day basis, there's no need to be a road fucker. There's no need to have an attitude. If you haven't got confidence in yourself, physical confidence, then you, you, some people, because they haven't got physical confidence, like they've never, they've never sort of uh, been in the gym, been in the ring and stuff like that, so they're not physically capable. They've got, they've got the uniform, they think, because it says place written on it, they're fucking invincible. No, you're not. And um, I had people with me that would start a fucking fight in an empty room. They, they, they didn't have anything about them, but they, couldn't, they didn't know how to communicate with people. So they get the, the wrong impression over and they gave an attitude. And that attitude, like I said before, affects your attitude, affects my attitude. And you raise the bar to the point where now you're arresting someone when you didn't need to. Um, so when I, when I uh, sort of, you know, there was like-minded officers, the same as me. Um, but these sort of people, it, it wasn't often, it was every now and again. So I'm not, I wasn't on a crusade knocking everyone and every dirty man out. It wasn't like that. It was, every, you know, every now and again, if I see them all sat up and then we'd deal with them. But it was, it was the realisation that there's some fucking horrible people out there. Another one, the worst, I think the worst one, or the one that I, I still think about is this, this fella, he uh, had robbed someone. Horrible little fucker he was. He had a knife. I think he stabbed the fella in the hand. We caught him. We caught him in the street. And he had a, we had a fight with him and got the knife off him and handcuffed him. And he'd stolen about six quid, but we couldn't find the money. So we said to him, right, we're going to have to strip search her. And he got previous for locking a kid in a fucking cupboard in his in his flat. You know what I mean? A kid, a 10-year-old, nine, a 12-year-old kid or something that was a neighbour, locked him in a fucking cupboard, the weirdo. So he goes, you ain't searching me. He said, we're going to have to, mate. Anyway, he started fighting. As we took his clothes off, he had a fucking bra on. <laughs> now we realised why he was fighting. We took his, took his jeans off. He's got fucking knickers on the suspenders, right? <laughs> so... So we, we've, we've left him in, because he was an horrible cunt, we just left him in that gear and chucked him in the cell, kept his clothes and put him in there in the stockings and suspenders, right? Didn't give him a paper suit, fuck you. Um, and then we found out, it, we went on the crime uh, reports and we found uh, that women were reporting their underwear being stolen off their washing lines. What was this fucking nut nut? And we went round, when we went round his ass, he had tons of fucking knickers and bras and um, you know what he's done to them, didn't you? Do you know what I mean? You think, oh. So we went back to him and I said to the sergeant, listen, we've got to remind him, we can't let him, we can't bail him because back then the sergeant or the inspector would decide whether or not you're getting bail or you're getting, we charge you, we're going to keep in custody and put you before the court. And the sergeant said, no, I'm just going to bail him. And I said, I fucking don't. I said, he's, he's a dirty, horrible, he's, he's, he's just a wrong one. And he, anyway, they, they bailed him. He never turned up for fucking bail, right? Never turned up to court. Charged him and bailed him. Never turned up for court. I then transferred to the Met, um, and then I hear on the news this same piece of shit as there was a hotel called the Cumberland Hotel, I think it was, and that was literally adjoining my police station, Marylebone. He'd gone in there and he'd raped a woman in her hotel room, and they caught him in Sussex in a stolen MR2. And I'm thinking, fucking hell. Yeah, I had that woman, Sarah Sands, on a couple of weeks ago. Old man abused her three sons. Yeah. He'd over nearly 30 crimes over yeah. 40 years. Abused her sons. He got bail. Yeah. She went round to say to him, look, admit this, or 
my sons need to go through all this torment again. She was he was calling her sons mm. a liar. He says, No, they're telling lies. Mm. And then she done them, man, killed them. Mm. She got three and a half years. Mm. But while she was doing her three and a half years, she dub they doubled her sentence. She got seven years. Fucking hell. Yeah. I so, mean the, the trouble you've got is people don't realise these individuals, um, it's a sex a sex offender and a paedophile, it's built into their DNA, as far as I believe. That's what I believe. It's built into their DNA. You cannot rehabilitate these kind of people no matter what you do. My priority is the victims because he's, these people are giving people life's fucking sentences at the end of the day. You know, the survivors, a lot of them, um, you know, they, they, they try and get over it, but there are a lot that don't, you know, and, and ultimately commit suicide. Why are we, um, as a society, uh, not, not making sure these people are locked up for long periods of time? You know, they use this buzzword, safeguarding. Safeguarding to me is locking these fuckers up when they've done their first offence, you know, like uh, incitement to, uh, you know, meet a child for sex, whatever they call it, you know, that should be a five-year sentence straight away, and you should do five years, yeah? It's, 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 we need to safeguard the kids. These people have got too many rights. They've got, they've got too many things going for them that they're not going to get, they know they're not going to get locked up. Yeah. You know, it's like a child porn. Again, five-year sentence. If you get caught with any form of child porn on your phone or on your computer, you should be banged up for five years. You get caught again, 10 years. Get these people off the streets. Well, yeah, because at the end of the day, they are not going to change. They are not going to change. And how many, if you go through the records, how many reoffend? Fucking most of them. Yeah. Most of them. They're, they're not going to change. But the UK sentences are too lenient. They, yeah. The UK here, we give them community service. Yeah. We can let them yeah. change their name for under 20 yeah. quid yeah. and then they're back out harming other kids. I mean, Places like Russia, yeah. they're getting a life sentence for touching yeah. a kid even I mean, once. Australia's taking their passports, yeah. their driver license mm -hmm. where you can't leave the country. The UK protect them. Why? Yeah. Like, it's so deranged. Even in Scotland, we had a guy raping mm -hmm. two women, mm -hmm. put a wig that. on, goes yeah, to court and yeah. they try to put yeah. him in a female prison yeah. and people are actually defending him saying yeah. he's got feelings. Yeah. Fuck his feelings. He yeah. should be getting locked up, thrown away the key. Yeah. That are he, I, I've always said this, like mm. with the death penalty, bring it back for sex offenders. Mm. Like you say, mm. they can't change the mindset. Yeah. It won't, it's scientifically proven yeah. they can't change that. Yeah. No matter what happens, no. two year sentence, three year mm. sentence ain't going to yeah. change the way they no. think about kids as you be put yeah. elsewhere. They should yeah. people should evil people should have the rights to know who's getting put into their streets, who's exactly. getting put into exactly. it's teachers yeah. and people are just changing identities now and it's yeah. too easy for sex offenders and sex mm. cases to then go around kids you've yeah. got all the transvestites and yeah. drag queens mm. around kids like yeah. majority of them might have good intentions mm. but kids shouldn't be around mm. drag queens while their dicks are out their tits are out mm. they're wearing mm. stockings and thongs and that's not right for a kid a kid shouldn't mm. be seen that and i'll say this i don't have anything against anybody as long as i'm not mm harming anyone mm. and bringing kids involved mm. then do what you want mm. like do you see do you see that method of thinking as deranged that like you see them like where well, there's no you're never going to change it ever yeah. anybody ever came forward because I, I i think there was somebody on twitter who had the tendencies mm. of being attracted to kids and mm basically a paedophile but mm. he'd never acted on it but he mm. can still watch his his sister's kids mm. his, his mm. other brother's kids mm. but he spoke out about it he mm. has those thoughts but he doesn't mm. act on it do you think anybody do you think people have ever came forward to get help to say that i need help because how hard is it when you've got an addiction or whatever from drink or drugs or gambling I mean, to come forward yeah, and admit I mean, something that's, that's no. a gray area that's that's a fucking that's a hard one do you think there should yeah. be more things in place for people yeah but w whether people would come forward and say they've got those tendencies yeah. is a different story but do you think there should be enough things in place to for people to go oh pff, definitely if if, if, there, if there's a, a some something in place where people who have got the tendency can be identified themselves to these mm. people then then that's what we need we don't want them running around under the radar with these tendencies because they might at some stage act on them you know i've always been of the opinion that that the most important person in, in these type of situations is the survivor yeah the person who's the perpetrator at the end of the day as far as i'm concerned you've got no rights you gave up your rights to, to uh, as an ordinary decent human being to be protected by the law when you touched the child or you know you looked at child pornography but therefore um, to safeguard th these people, which are the priority, you are going to be locked up for a long time. And what we should do is people with drug habits, um, minor criminals, petty thieves, they should be put on community service, take them out of the prisons and put these fuckers in their cells. Yeah, Because that way they're off the streets, they don't need to be supervised by the police, 
yeah, to the t in terms of you know having to check on these people, let the prisons deal with them, lock them up five years, ten years, life, whatever. I don't really give a fuck as long as they're off the streets, because the the question that I'd ask anyone is if you're at a bus stop with your kids, who would you rather be stood next to? Some of them a drug problem or a petty, a petty thief or a fucking paedophile or a sex case. <laughs> it's a simple answer, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and as I said, I, you know, I've ex I've explained that I've, I've you know what I've done with with sex cases, and, and unfortunately, I don't regret what I did. It, it was it's not right. It's you know legally it was wrong, completely wrong. Morally is a different sort of question. Yeah, I would back your you know, for what you've done. You know, um, I and, I, I, and, and I'm not I'm not defending myself what I did. But if you understand when you're in that environment, I mean, the the, the most the bravest police officers that you could ever have are the ones that do child sex crimes and 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 you know women who have been sexually abused, right? That is a tough, that is a tough gig. CO19 firearms officers, anti-terrorism coppers, you know, all the, you know, all the singing, all dancing, tough guys. No, the, the, those people, those individuals that are doing that kind of stuff. I mean, I've got open respect for, obviously, for all police officers, but those individuals that have got the mental strength to do that, mate, I've, when I've read things that these people have done, it was just, it just, you know, it wasn't good. What's it like interviewing a pedophile? Luckily, I haven't. I haven't done Never. that. I've, I've read evidence you think in you a could, file. Do you think you could hold your temper? No, I couldn't. No, that's. I'll, I'll admit, mate. I'm not. I'm, you know, I wasn't the best Why police officer. Why are you so officer. passionate about that? I just, I just think um, it's the worst crime you could commit. It's the fucking worst crime you could ever commit. Right, touching a kid or looking at that sort of stuff. Um, you, you know, that's something. I don't believe in God and I don't believe in the devil. But if there was a devil, I'd say these are the these are the fucking disciples. Do you know what I mean? Um, and I, and I, as I said, having read stuff and having been briefed on what had happened to a kid and what they did to him, and being in front of the kid and seeing the state of him, I mean, that's that to me is you know my my worst nightmare mm -hmm. to to see someone like that. So then to be faced, even though I'm in police uniform, to be faced with a piece of shit that perpetrates these crimes, I wasn't strong enough. I wasn't professional enough to just fucking let it go. Yeah. yeah, I wasn't professional enough, um, and you know, and this is where we come into impartiality. And then, well, obviously, you're not you're not a good police officer. You're a fucking uniform. You're a vigilante. Probably was all those things. You know what? What can I fucking say? I'm not a saint, as we'll soon find out. But I have a set of principles. Do you know what I mean? And the three of them is: don't hit coppers, don't don't hit old people, women, or attack, you know, sexually abused kids. Any of those things you do, then you're in trouble. It's as simple as that. Now, old school criminals know what the score was back in the day. If they hit a copper, they're going to get a double clump. They know what the score is and they accept it because that's part of part and parcel of, you know, back in them days. Nowadays, it's completely different. Um, there's a, there, you know, people go, oh, fucking police hitting people. I don't agree with police brutality, right? I don't agree with it in any way, shape or form. Yeah. Um, but there's certain issues, certain times in a police officer's life where he's going to have to use sheer fucking violence. Um, it's either you or the individual. You know, and I've got a problem with the police in today's sort of society. And I've always had it really in terms of a police officer should be f as fit as fuck. It should look the part. Yeah. When I see fat boy walking down the road with his hat on, I'm thinking, what are you going to do? If your colleague's having his head kicked in 100 metres away, you're not getting there. You owe it to yourself as a police officer, as a human being. But when you step into that uniform, you owe it to yourself, your family, your colleagues and the public to be as fit as you can be. Yeah, not an orange on a toothpick, not a fucking little skinny person or a big fat blob. You need to be fit. Get yourself down to a certain level, a decent level of fitness. The police fitness test is a joke. The police self-defense training is a joke. It's all worrying about if someone gets hurt, we might get sued. Listen, if these people are worried about getting hurt, get the fuck out of here. Because when you go on road and you're in a fight, and I've seen it, police officers freeze. My personal opinion is you should be, you know, obviously you've got a good communication skills. That's your, that's your, you know, they say your tactical options, like your batting and your ass, your ass boy, your, your spray, your, your taser in there. The first, firstly, it's your gob. You've got to be able to talk to people because most of the time I, I, I would be able to talk to people reasonably. I was confident in my own physical abilities. I'm, I'm not a fucking hard nut, but I could fight. I was a fighter. I trained for years, day in, day out, two, three hours a day. So I'm, I'm confident, I, I've, you know, my nose is flat. I've, I've had, you know, I can take a punch. So if someone hit me, it wouldn't faze me. But some of these people that are in the job, they've never had any kind of physical confrontation. Now they're stepping into the lion's den. 
like I said, life's not a bowl of fucking cherries. You're going to come across people like that that are nasty, horrible, bad people, and they will turn around and knock your teeth down your throat. So there's an element for me that the self-defense training, people should get their asses down the gym, go boxing, do uh, UFC training, you know, all that kind of stuff. Learn, learn proper, you know, learn how to take a punch and learn how to fight properly. Because arm bars and arm locks and all this tosh they teach the police to do doesn't work when you're on your own. I mean, it might be five or six years, yeah, that's fine. But if you're on your own and it's toe to toe with someone and you can't fire a punch, you're fucked. Um, I'm, not, I'm not advocating, as I say, I'm not advocating everyone goes, that starts whacking people. No, I'm not. I'm saying when it comes down to it, you've got two choices when you're in a life or death situation. You either fold like a deck of cards because you're worried about getting a complaint or you end up on a fucking slab. You know, or, or you know, yeah. you end up on a slab. Did you get penalised for that? When I did um, assault, which is what I did, I assaulted uh, these uh, these these paedophiles um, and stitched them up. Um, no, well, my colleagues were around me. We we're, we're all of the same opinion. You know, we stick together. They're dirty, fucking, horrible people. Um, I was more interested in in how can you put it? See, see, you go to a job. Uh, the people, as I said to you before spending time with decent people, but you see the worst in people. You join the place, you see the absolute fucking worst in people. I mean, I was, I was from the East End, I was on the streets, you know, I was, I, I, you know, I've done a fair bit, but as soon as I got dropped in, dropped into the, you know, the police, it was a fucking eye-opener, you know? You, 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 you sort of, all your thoughts that you have, you, you know, it, you've got to change, you, you've got to be completely and utterly impartial. And I failed on that, I, you know, I put my hands up, like I said, I just couldn't, I couldn't comprehend, I couldn't deal with these people. I thought, you're fucking dangerous. You, you're, you know, you're a child molester and you're standing there and you're laughing, you think you're fucking funny. You know what I mean? So in my eyes, every time I see you, I'm going to fucking terrorise you. And, and you, you're going to know what it's like to be a fucking victim there. Uh, and uh, it wasn't on a day-to-day -day basis. It was every now and again we'd see these individuals. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, one, one little fuckery, he uh, was going in women's clothes shops saying, oh, I just want to try, my, my, my wife, my, buy something for my wife. She's the same size as me as well. I just try it on. He would go and then start like masturbating, waiting for the woman to come over and open the curtain. I mean, what the fuck? You know what I mean? Another one sniffing around young children with a, a, a long record and I'm thinking, he's done all this, but he's still walking the streets. What the fuck's going on? Um, Why do you think the sentences are too lenient in the, in I the just, UK? I think a lot of it's to do with the po prison population. I genuinely think that there's, there's not enough room. The judges are given scope and say, look, we can't keep locking them up. I mean, the worst thing is, I think last year or the year before, uh, sex offences against children and young people is at its highest it's ever been. I mean, we could say phones and, and the internet are a lot to blame for that. Um, but uh, again, the sentencing is, is just, it's just shit. You know, it's, it, I, I just genuinely believe, listen, if we had a load of ex-military personnel, when you come out of prison, you've got fuck all. You go and see a probation, there's no motivation. In jail, you go to work, you come back to jail, you go to gym. Do you know what I mean? You've got a set sort of routine. When you come out of jail, you've got nothing. So as far as I'm concerned, so, sort of people with drug habits, they should be dealt with on the outside, got a clinks, but they should be given. If you had ex-army people working off the uh, probation service that were motivators, that maybe got them jobs in warehouses. There's plenty of fucking jobs in warehouses and shop, shops and stuff like that. Pick them up in a minibus from wherever they, 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 they are, drop them off in the morning, pick them up at night. Give them a fucking routine when they come out because they come out to nothing. And what do they do? They revert to type. They go back to the same environment and pick up where they left off because they've got nothing to change that environment. Some, some don't, don't get me wrong. We, you know, there's other people who think, do you know what, fucking hell, I can't be going back in there. Yeah. So but, you've done that for six years, 92 to 98. I did um, yeah, Essex from no, 92 to uh, 95, and then I transferred to the Met in 95, went to Marylebone, um, and that was completely different. What's different from the beat to the Met? Because when uh, in the county forces, like Essex, and uh, you, you know everyone, you know everyone. So I was at Grey's, I knew every copper at Ockenden, I knew every copper at Corringham, Tilbury. Um, so we all know if there was a knobhead in one of the, police station we know who they were or grass or someone like that do you know what I mean we couldn't trust we'd know when you go to the Met you're not a fucking name anymore you're just a number because there's so many of you but again with Essex as I was saying to you you know people goes, oh he's fun listen right I've only ever and, and my colleagues have only ever uh, had proper scraps when we've had to the reason one of the reasons main reasons because there's not enough of us to start proper you know what I mean when you're in Essex you've got to be able to talk to people because 
your your backup might be ten minutes away. So you've got a, you've got to have good communication skills. You know you're going to nick this person, but you can't do anything yet because you need backup. So you have to you have to have good communication skills. Um, and if you're uh, and and in the Met, it's not so. That's why it's probably got it had a bad reputation back in the day for for people um, abusing you know the public, public because. You'd get someone who start, like I said to you before, would start a fucking fight in an empty room like a copper because he's got bad communication skills. What makes a good copper? I th- you, you've got to be well rounded. You've got to have life experience. You, you, you know, you, I, I personally think ex-military, someone who's from a sporting background, or you, you know, you can have a, a, a people from offices from all walks of life. You've got to have that sort of combination. I know, but a good copper is someone who can speak. Who's, who, who, that's I keep coming back to it. But if you can, if you can talk someone down rather than handcuff them on the floor and, and have a scrap then you're winning aren't you do you know what i mean winning friends and influencing people that's what they say mm-hmm. so when did you join the royal family uh i went from Malibone to uh um 98 i went to royal protection what was that decision why well, i made that decision yeah as i said to you because um we uh i i was from an old school sort of policing environment. So people will know back in the 90s, what happens if you hit a copper? You're going to get a double clump if, because who else is there to protect us but us? You know, so our mindset was um, that if you if you were sort of police officer, then you're going to get a fucking hard smack. So there was a thing back in the day called a reception committee. So if you've, if you've, if you've hit someone, if you, you know, a police officer, you just call up on the radio re- reception committee. Everyone goes back to the police station. They line up, and as you bring this person through, they get a fucking clump off of every- everyone before they get into the custody office. Um, was it justified? Was it right? Yes and no. As I say, I'm only going to be honest in my own opinion. Other people might say, "Well, you fucking cunt." Well, that's my opinion. Yeah, no one else is going to protect us. And if you don't, in our eyes back then, it was different society. As I said. If you don't teach this individual that assaulting a police officer, you're going to get hurt yourself. It will carry on doing it. And it could kill someone at the end of the day. Um, an example would be uh, one fella. He was a nice, nice bloke. Uh, he was a beat officer. And um, he used to go around to the schools and the old people's homes and do all the stuff that, you know, people want to see a police officer. He didn't want to be running around in police cars and, you know, with sirens on. He just wanted a quiet life, riding a bike, um, which is fine, you know. He he, he wasn't he wasn't uh, physically capable either. If you know what I mean, he was just a nice bloke. And his nickname was Wilf because they called him Wilf because he was always in old people's homes eating tea and cake. And um, on one particular occasion, he was on a night jury. He was on his own, single crewed, and all the local yobs knew him and used to take the piss out of him because he didn't have anything about him. Anyway, he's gone to this this disturbance one night and they've just kicked the absolute fuck out of him, absolutely bad him. Do you know what I mean? For no good reason. Um, so we we went down there. We, we we systematically got on one by one, and we fucking smashed it to pieces. And uh, and as far as I'm concerned, rightly so. Ten ten people onto one police officer. Yeah. No, you got to set an example. You got to set an example to these fucking thugs that don't care about the law. They're terrorising old people. They're fucking robbing people, and they're doing this, that, and others. Do you know what I mean? You got to cut the head off the snake. And that's that's what we thought. Well, that's how we were back in them days. It wasn't about going around beating everyone up. It wasn't. It was about when you're involved with dangerous people that are willing to go and do that to a police officer, you've got to fight fire with fucking fire and close them down and shut them down and put them back in their place and make them understand if you do that, this is what we're going to do. Um, and uh, and that's how it was. So I've gone to the Met. I've gone to the Met. Um, similar thing happened. Two British transport police officers were viciously assaulted by four scumbags they beat the shit out of them at oxford circus train station so um i uh i turned up with a colleague uh, we was in the sherpa van back then we just had bench seats it didn't have cages or anything like that um and they've put one of these scumbags in the back of our van i've jumped in the back but unbeknownst to me a, a female officer from holborn had got into the passenger seat i didn't know who she was so that was that was my mistake because if you're going to deal with something the way we as I said we deal with it make sure you're with your own people I, I didn't didn't see her get in the van anyway so I had a conversation with this fella explained so I'm going to take the cuffs off and we're going to have a fucking straightener you know again 
I'm not being a big man or anything like that, but that's how it was. It's just, mate, you can't go around. Look, the state of them two offices for no good reason because you're pissed up and you was hassling people. And they've come to ask you to fuck off home nicely and you've turned on them. All right, so we ended up having a scrap and I, and I knocked him out. And um, this officer had heard me say about a straightener and something. Other than, she heard the scuffle, but she couldn't see exactly what had gone on. But she looked around and he was uncuffed and he was unconscious. Um, and she'd reported it to her inspector. And back in them days, um, it was just starting to come where, where officers were, the, the supervisors before would sort of fuck it off and say, listen, go and sit down, don't worry about it, and leave it, and wouldn't take the complaint any further. But this time, this inspector did. And um, I got word that uh, anti-corruption were coming down to interview me about an assault. So I wrote my statement out um, because... What they do is they'll come down and goes, all right, listen, it's, not, it's not, nothing bad, but we should have a little chat off the record. What happened? And they're fucking all mic'd up. Do you know what I mean? You know, for any officers out there, never ever talk to the anti-corruption command unless it's on tape and always have your prepared statement. Um, and uh, I said, no, I said, I'm, it's in the statement, Chief Inspector. He goes, all right. I said, I can't talk, say anything more, sir. Just read the statement. That's what I remember. Or I'll read it for you. So it's all right. And then he said to me, all right, um, the person that I'd, I'd had a scrap with didn't make a complaint about me. He got charged with assault on police, um, but never m mentioned a word about what happened. All right, so it wasn't a complaint from him. It was just this officer. He said, all right, well, look, we're going we're gonna to let this go this time. Um, he said, I know what you fucking did. He goes, I understand why you did it. I said, but you, he said, but you can't fucking do these things anymore. He goes, they're taught at training school. Now, officers coming through training school that if they see something they don't like, they need to report it to a supervisor. And I just thought, okay, my my sort of way I thought, which is rightly or wrongly, um, you know, loyalty to my colleagues and, and, and whatever else, I just thought, I'm done, I'm done. I, I was quite wealthy at the time. You know, I, I was importing Porsches and Mercedes and because I wanted to be a millionaire, as I said. I was buying and selling property. Um, you know, I had a nice car, two nice cars, Mercedes. Um, so I had money wrapped around me. Did I need to stay in the job? Not really, but I did because I loved the environment. I loved the people I worked with. Do you think you loved the violence though? And you got away with it a bit more because you were a copper? No, I did. My violence, the violence, most of the violence I did was in the ring. You know, I, I did, but I boxed for the Met. I won the heavyweight title. So, so the violence that I, I did uh, was on people that would, that would attack police officers or we had to fight them. Most of the time, we would restrain them properly and deal with them properly. Like I said, at the end of the day, I don't want to. I don't want to disrespect people. But if I'm arresting you, you're going to have to come with me one way or another. You know what do you do? You can't. You can't. And no, not everyone's going to come quietly. You know. And I don't. You know. If I can put someone in a, in, a, in cuffs quickly and safely and get them away, then that's what I'm going to do. It's the point where you know you're going to have to have a fist fight with this person because there's two of you. It's dangerous and whatever else. And you're going to have to take care of business or, or try to anyway. Don't get me wrong. I've been flung about and all the rest of it. But um, sometimes you have, to, you have to fight fire with fire, as I said to you. Do you, you know? think that's years and years of being in the job, you kind of lose yourself though? And, yeah, you do. you do. You can lose yourself. And you forget yeah, what you're listen, actually there for. Yeah, I did. I lost myself. Do you know what I mean? I, uh, uh, you know, I, lost, I lost the qualities that you should have to be a police officer. I did. What can I say? Is that the last straw then in the van? Like you say, yeah, you've got yeah, money, you've got property, yeah, you've got cars. Yeah, I, uh, Why not just live I, as the I other said, life? As like, I said, I, I got in the environment of being a, being, being a police officer and I enjoyed the camaraderie. I mean, I mean we was, you know, everyone like, back in the days, we used to have, have a good laugh and all the rest of it. And, you know, when the chips were down, we were there for each other. And, you know, as I said, that's when it came to, uh, you know, when it came to looking after each other, that's, that's how it went. I'm not saying that's standard across the board for all police officers. No, it wasn't. Do you know what I mean? You know, we, we were certain officers had the same mindset. You know, you can't tar what I did back in the day. You can't tar everyone with the same brush, you know. Um, but I, I, I didn't want to get assaulted anymore. I mean, the reason, again, I got assaulted um, when, when I was in the first year of my job. Um, I went and tried to deal with this, this, this fellow who was drunk and disorderly. I said, look, you know, I was, if oh, I could take care of myself, I was too frightened to, to, to actually use my skills that I knew I could use because I was, I was just a young cop. I was brand new. I didn't want to get in trouble. And because of that, because of that fear, this, I let this individual get too close to me and he headbutted me and we ended up having a scrap and I, and I held him, but I was shaken. Usually I, I can deal with 
calmness, if we're dealing with a violent situation, the most important thing is to be calm and focus and know what you're doing. It's when you're not calm and it's when you're not focused is when the person you're trying to restrain gets hurt. Yeah? And, and the most important thing in a violent situation is to secure that person. Yeah? It's not to hurt them unless you have to to, to, to to fucking restrain them. So what happens then after that event? He got off at court. He got off at court. Uh, not guilty. I went to Snaresbrook and um, probably I didn't give my evidence like I should have done. I was young in the job or whatever else. Um, you know, um, and I thought, you know what, that's the first and last time I'm going to get assaulted in the neighbourhood law. Is that when you decided to work for the royal family? No, that was that was in Essex. And then obviously I went to the Met and then that incident happened with with um, with the van incident. And then I went, I rung a friend of mine who was on the Royal Protection Squad um, and he was running the self-defence uh, training up there. And he said, why don't you come up and, um, and run it with me? Obviously as a Royal Protection Officer. So that's what I did. I said, yeah, fuck the streets, I've had enough. Um, and I went out to Royalty. Um, it was quite uneasy. As I say, you know, the Masonic influence back in the day was quite strong. It wasn't like what you know, it was who you know. Um, and so I was given the answers to the questions I was going to be asked in the interview. Um, I was given pictures of members of the royal family and they wrote the names. So I knew. I, so the, the, there was four, two, a sergeant, uh, two sergeants and two uh, civilians, like admin people. So the two, two police knew <laughs> that I was clued up, but these two didn't. So they were asking me all these questions and I was going, bum, bum, bum. Oh, he knows everything, doesn't he? And uh, yeah, so I got straight in. We went up there for a day first just to, to have a look around and um, and let people have a look at you because it's quite a clicky environment. Mm. I mean, I remember, uh, it's, you know, it's a well-paid job. Royal Protection is well, well-paid. How much we're talking? You can earn upwards of 70 grand a year. Yeah, you can smash it. Uh, because the protection has to be at a certain level. So the overtime they were paying there, if it, it couldn't go between a certain level, the amount of officers on post that, you know, had to be that level. So if they were short, they would pay for overtime and all the rest of it. And Scotland, they would go up to Balmoral, Burke Hall. Um, so you could earn you could earn a serious amount of money. <laughs> we used to drive past when I was at Marylebone. We used to drive past the fellows on the gate thinking, fucking hell, look at it, what a boring job. And when I got up there, they said, and I, I sat, told that story, I said, yeah, we used to look at you lot going, look at them fucking idiots working for a living. <laughs> and, and it was true, you know. Mm -hmm. And when I went in there, there was a lot of old officers in there. Do you know what I mean? And my, 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 my mate said, oh, come up, it's a hope, you know, we'd have a laugh. I went up, it's, it looked like a fucking save from Cocoon. You know, I, was, I walked into <laughs> a fucking old people's home. Mm -hmm. I've come off of the streets, fresh from the streets, like with a bit of swagger, and I've walked into an old people's home. I was like, fucking hell. Did that calm you down, that job? Yeah, yeah, it did. It calmed me down, um, and um, uh, yeah, I, you know, I went on a firearms course and uh, two-week firearm, intensive firearms course, which you had to obviously had to pass, um, and um, yeah, and, and, and went there, and uh, it was uh, it was it was a good time, but it was old school coppers on there, which you know I said about old school, and you know, did, I was whatever I you know things I did, but it was old school, so everyone was clicked in together. You know, and discretion was the word. Um, but when you join Royal Protection, you're not a police officer anymore. You're now part of the Royal Household. Therefore, your loyalty is to the Queen and the family and, you know, that environment, which is very, which is a very different sort of environment to policing, you know? It's very different because you're now, you're not a police, you're not policing anymore. You're not looking... Protect and serve yeah, and what yeah, I yeah, yeah, you're not you're not being proactive anymore in terms mm -hmm. of going out looking for crime. That's that's not your role anymore. Your mm -hmm. role is to protect the Queen um and the integrity of the palace, you know. What was your first day like? Um oh, my first day I got I uh, got put on post with these these two uh these two older coppers, um, both a pair of tubby blokes. And uh one was nicknamed was Doug the Slug. <laughs> Right, and uh, so we're on post at the side door at Buckingham Gate and they're standing there looking at people going by. And I was like, ah, oh, trying to settle into this new role. And um, all of a sudden these two cars, shunt, one shunted this car, went boom, like that. And so everyone goes, oh, I went, fucking hell. And they just and they just turned around and looked the other way. I went, we're not going over these. Listen, what's on this side of the line, we worry about it. What's on that side of the line, the locals worry about it. So keep your fucking nose out. I was like, you can't do that. So I know I just went, went out anyway, went over there and I made sure everyone was all right and then wait for the local police to come along. Went back over there, said, what did we fucking tell you? I said, I guess you can't be doing things. Like, if you want to do that, piss off back to division. I was thinking, really? 
you know and that's that's what it was like it was like fucking no you, you're you're in there now you're not out there how many police work in Buckingham Palace at one time? I said this time. before on, on Lad Bible and people started going mad, going, hey, shut me, he's delivering, he's telling secrets and all that. Listen, mate, it's 30 years ago, right? It doesn't matter if, if I tell you there was 30 police officers there or 300. It doesn't matter. Um, you know, there's there's usually about 30 on shift. Um, and then obviously you've got to remember that back then there was sophisticated alarm systems and all kinds of things that obviously I'm not going to go into detail, but there's a lot of things in place after Fagan had got in. So, you know, it'd be pretty difficult. You'd be tracked. If you entered any part of the palace, you'd be tracked literally until we got to you. You know, there's a lot of lot of procedures, a lot of lockdown that would happen. Um, and helicopters and dogs and you know what I mean, it'd be surrounded in fucking minutes. Um so yeah, it's uh you would have about thirty on, on on shift um at any one time. Um armed obviously. Um and um and yeah, it was. It, I, I never really. There was a. There was a time. Someone said to me, "Oh, did, did ever, ever, anyone ever get in the palace when you was there?" And they did. I forgot. I forgot. It was Fathers for Justice. I think a fellow in a Batman costume managed to get on the colonnade and, and climb along. Um, I don't think the Queen was in that day, but he. He. But we tracked him. We could see him. Do you know what I mean? It's not like he got in and we didn't know who it was. He just climbed up, come along. The alarms all went off, and, and he was tracked. And uh, yeah, that was on the news. Who Who lived in the palace when the you Queen, were looking? The Queen, Prince Philip and Prince Andrew, um, which I was there six years, so I saw him on a fairly regular basis. And know. he's a main talking point, isn't he, Prince Andrew? Like, how was he treated? Um, he, was, he wasn't well liked. He was a, he's a fucking plum, if I'm going to be honest. He was rude, obnoxious. I know I've, said it, I've said it in loads of uh, interviews. He was a rude, obnoxious individual. He was just a nasty, nasty, horrible little man. He's never heard the word no in his life, you know? And I, I always said if if Prince Philip has stuffed the bar of soap in his gob the first time he told a servant to fuck off, most of this probably wouldn't have happened. You know, he, he, he had the run of the place. Um, I never really had any problems with any other members of the royal family in the way I did before. Or not just me, all of us, you know. Um, he was just he was just a horrible individual. He was so rude when there was no need to be rude. You know, and I, I couldn't believe it. The first time he told me to fuck off, I went, really? I was like, what? If that was on on the streets, he'd be getting folded in half like a piece of paper and put in the back of a police van. And he was like that. It's like, fucking hell, that's Prince Andrew talking to us like that. It was a shock. But then you get used to it and you think, oh, because the gate wasn't open in time or the barrier didn't come down. It's like, fucking imbeciles. It's like, what are you talking about? We're here to protect you. What are you gobbing off for? <laughs> you know? What was the story before his teddy bears? Oh, mate. So basically, we... Uh, on the weekends, the Queen, the Queen and Prince Philip would go to Windsor, and Andrew would fuck off as well. So the apartments were empty, royal apartments were empty. We'd have to go and do alarm checks, and all their personal attack alarms. So certain places, there's there's buttons for them to press if there's an issue. So we had to use, have to go around all the bedrooms and check to make sure they're all in working order. We'd do that at the weekends, and uh, a couple of us and the inspector went in went into his apartment. Probably when I first went up there, I think, and. Um, he had fucking tons of teddy bears on his bed, like loads. And uh, 72, I didn't realise it. I said 50 originally, and then the maid said, no, it was 72. And um, I was like, fucking, what's going on here? And um, and then the inspector said, in the drawer, they'd got a laminated card of picture of all these teddy bears on the bed. He goes, he goes basically, if the maids don't put the teddy bears back exactly like this is in that picture, he goes into one, he flips. I was like, What? You know, it's just, and then you think, that's a sort of coercive behaviour, really, isn't it? You know what I mean? You will put my fucking teddy bears back in that place where I'm going to abuse you. And that's what he did. He, the maids were shit scared of him, you know? In fact, that maid, one of them who came forward, I did an ITV interview, and I think that's where it came out. And the maid saw it and came forward and said, look, he's telling the truth. And, you know, he's he had to run up four flights of stairs to shut his curtains, and he was sat right next to him. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. What's that all about? Did you ever feel any different sort of energy with him? Like obviously working in the police force and being around all the, the nasty people, did you ever feel a presence that there's something not right with him? Or did you just think he was a spoiled kid? I just thought he was a sport, yeah, a sport fella, a sport bloke. Yeah, he was, he was just, he had no regard for people, we say below him, we're all human beings, do you know what I mean? He just had, he had a title, yeah. you know what I mean? He had a title, HRH, just because you've got a fucking title doesn't mean you're a good person. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Was he the favourite? Yeah. I mean, he got away with absolute fucking murder. I mean, you know, we were letting people in. We didn't know who the fuck they were. 
and uh, if we said anything, we'd get top sharp. You know, it was one of them ones. What do you do? You're, you're working as a robber protection officer. If you don't like it, fuck off back to the streets and roll around with a drunk on a Friday night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and, and what? Where, where are you going with this? People were saying, oh, you should have made, we made complaints to uh, supervisors, but where's it going to go? Who's going to go to the Queen and say, you need to reel him in? Because they'll just say, really? Fuck off. Get your kit and fuck off. You know, the, the commanders, Royal Protection Commanders, not going to go to the Queen and say, oh, Prince Andrew, this. The Royal Household are a machine. You know what I mean? That's what people need to understand. That You can't be going and making complaints about members of the Royal Family. That's just not how it is, unfortunately. You know? And, you know, if you cross them, then you're in trouble. I mean, there was things that went on there that I wasn't comfortable with. Again, there was uh, one of the cleaners, um, and another, another thing is domestic violence. I, don't, I hate people who, you know, do that to women, but she came in one day, she had a drink problem, you know, and there's a few, a few uh, you know, members of staff that did have drink problems, and the Queen looked after them. She's a really nice person. She, she knew they had, they were, you know, had problems, and she just turned a blind eye. And this particular cleaner came in with a black eye as I was on post in my college. She said, oh, you all right? We talk, oh, she talked to him. She went, yeah, yeah, I'm all right. Didn't really want to say too much. She didn't want to talk and just went into the palace. I said, oh, I wonder what's going on anyway. Let it go. And then a couple of weeks later, she's fucking coming with another one. I went, no, 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 no. I said to him, what's going on? She went, oh, nothing, nothing. Well, her husband was a, was a security guard down at the Mews. And then we found out he'd been knocking her about. So I went to the governor and said, listen, we have to lift him. We can't, he can't be having that. He's, he's, you know, we report this domestic, it's domestic violence. You can't be having this. Um, and she, that was it. she had a cut lip as well. And he goes, oh, I'm gonna, I'll speak to the household. So I we went up to the household and they fucking told us to leave it. He goes, oh, I'm just going to go and have a word with him, but we're not going to do anything about it. I'm thinking, what? What do you mean you're not going to do anything? It's like, what, we're just going to turn the fucking blind eye to domestic abuse? Um, we couldn't believe it. So uh, anyways, this, this inspector's gone down to their private, they had a private flat within the palace, yeah, down in the news. And I've had a word with him. He's come back, he goes, fucking all the geezers alone. I said, What's, what do you mean? Because he's got all Nazi memorabilia all over his house, all over the flat. Like, I said, like, what? So anyway, we, did, we did, didn't leave it. We, we, on night duty, he was, he was working with us. So we took him down into the car park, half a dozen of us. And we basically said to him, listen, we know what you're doing. If your wife comes in with one more bruise, you're going to end up with half a dozen. Um, so we stuck it on him, and um, and after that, um, yeah, she, she she seemed okay, but I just couldn't get my head around why have we got to fucking not deal with him as if it was on road, he'd, he'd be lifted. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? What happens if he kills her for fuck's sake? How much stuff is swept under the carpet in the royal household? There is a lot of stuff. I mean, like I said, I'm not a disloyal prick. You know, I've I've opened my god, but there's certain things I won't talk about. Do you know what I mean? I, I'm not doing it for me. You know, um, I'm doing it because people should know what Prince Andrew's like. And I'll bear my soul and, I'll, and I'll, there's more to come about what I've done. You know, I'm not going to sit here and, you know, tell you things to, to make myself look good. I'm, you know, people are going to look at me and think, he's a cunt, which is fair enough. But at the end of the day, I can't change what I've done. I'm talking about it because some people might might sort of, some of the things I'll talk about might relate to that and it, it somehow might help them. Do you know what I mean? But there's a lot of things um, that was swept under the carpet. I mean, another incident that I've spoken about but has never been aired was uh, a senior member of the, uh, the Queen's uh, team um, came up to us one night was on was at the front of the palace and he was pissed. Uh, and he said, because um, I need you to go and get my briefcase back. I've been assaulted. And I said, oh, calm down, what's, what's going on? He goes, I was in a, it turns out he was in a topless bar and he's groped one of the waitresses and he's got a slap by the bouncers. I rightly fucking so but they've chucked him out and he's not got his briefcase back. So when we've heard the story, we said, listen, mate, just, just go home. I don't give a fuck who he is. You know, if that's what you've done, then sorry, what, what do you want me to do about it? And he's going, no, I want my, you will get my breast. I won't do anything. And he's talking to me like I'm a piece of shit. So I called the governor up and he's gone, um, he's gone just, just, he's, he's, he's then said, I've got palace papers, like secret papers in this briefcase. Obviously once he said that, we're fucked, aren't we? So we've had to go to the club and retrieve the briefcase. And and the bouncer said, listen, he had his hands all over. It was sexual assault at the end of the day, you know? And I said to him, well, we didn't say to him, but we should have said to him, do you know, just you want to make it. I mean, they probably get it all the time. It's not right. But back then, again, so he was a creepy little fucker. And he's, and he's one close aides to the Queen. What do you think of Prince Andrew? Especially all the stuff out about him now. Yeah, look. I, whether it, where, did he sleep with uh, 
Jufre, I don't know. You know, assumptions are the mother of all fuck ups. We can assume things based on what's been said, but we don't know the full facts and the full evidence because it's never been aired. You know, I mean, Prince Andrew, m from what I, my perception is, like I said, with the royal household, if you uh like with Prince Princess Diana, when I came up to Royal Protection, a lot of the officers had a massive dislike for Prince Charles because they blamed him for her death. Yeah, and the way she was treated by the royal household because once you deviate from their script the knives are out for you yeah um and so you've got a, you, she was brought in as breeding stock that's how these upper class people look at it she was just brought in purely to provide an heir to the throne prince charles didn't have any sort of you know uh care for her because he was seeing camilla and um and, and you know she was she treated badly i believe so my, like my colleagues believe believe she was um and, and so the household uh they don't change. They're like that. I mean, the Meghan Markle situation, I'm not defending her. I'm not, not having a go at her. But she's probably come into that environment and they've said, you're going to, they give you a list to say, right, you're not going down the shops anymore. You're not going, to, this is your list of engagements for the rest of your fucking life. Because that's what happened to the Queen. She knew what she was doing every fucking day because it was put in front of her first thing in the morning. You're going here, you're going there, you're doing this, you're meeting this person. I mean, it's, it's for me, that's not an, a, good, a nice life. I mean, she's, you know, all my hat off to her, but would you want that kind of life where you're, you're, you're now being told exactly what you're going to do in each fucking day. And I think similar to that's what's happening. People say, Oh, she was told before she, what was going to happen. Fine. That's fine. But people can change their mind, can't they? Yeah. It's a different thing knowing what you're going to do. to when you're actually doing it. Mm -hmm. So I, that's what I think, you know, the Royal household turned against, turned against. And I did, I did say that what happens is you get a lot of uh, articles in the press. A source said, a spokesman said, a friend said, no, it's the royal household are putting these things out there. They're, they're putting stories out there to try and um, coerce the public into believing in what they want you to believe. Do you know what I mean? The, this, the source said, or a friend of Prince Andrew said, well, why hasn't the friend got the balls to put his name on that fucking statement that he's just said? Stand up and tell us who you are. Mm -hmm. So what I got for the Prince Andrew interview it just it's just not the sharpest tool in the shed. Like I think because he's always getting people saying yes to him, yeah. I think he thinks people are stupid like that interview yeah. Yeah. With, with Jeffrey Epstein thing and mm. breaking up, who was a, a, a convicted sex case. He's went and partied with him for five days because he didn't want to hurt his feelings and he thought it would I mean, be a chicken yeah. to go and speak to him. Like was a did you see was Prince Andrew just a party boy who just loved birds and yeah, partying? I mean, that's, or is there question marks with younger kids yeah i mean this is this is what i've been asked a lot a lot and all i can say is what i saw and that is women in their 20s early 20s to the late 20s probably um coming in and out uh frequently uh different times of the uh, different, usually after five o'clock when the palace is shut these individuals turn up we were not privy to their names which is obviously a security issue we should know who's coming to the palace and i've said this before you know, if someone turns up, we do get people that have got, uh, you know, um, sort of psychological issues uh, and say they're here to see the Queen when, when she was on obviously. Um, obviously, clearly they're not. You know, I'm here to see the Queen. I'm here to see Prince Philip. Well, this is what we were getting. Similar people come here to see Prince Andrew. Um, and, I, you know, if people have heard it before, I'll tell the story again. So on one, one occasion, we couldn't get hold of his footman. So we, we're going to have to hold you for a minute until we can just confirm the appointment. She said, oh, it's fine, I've got his, shall I ring Prince Andrew? So we said, yeah, okay. He'd just previously come in about half hour before. Um, and so she rang him and we could hear him on the phone and he said, put one of the officers on. So my colleague took the phone and he said, listen to me, you fat lardy ass cunt, let my guest in, now I'm going to come down there. Um, we all heard it and she went bright red and we just thought, in you go. So obviously after that, we just didn't want to be on the wrong side of him. So we were letting people in, coming up, I'm here to see Prince Andrew, I'm here to see Prince Andrew. So we just let, let them in. Now, the problem with that is, um, or was, and, that, and, and then turned out to be a problem, was uh, someone did a similar thing at Windsor, Windsor his, uh, his place in Windsor, um, turned up in a taxi and said, I'm here to see Prince Andrew. But she actually wasn't anything to do with him. She, I think she said she was his fiance. Well, the Royal Protection Officers were obviously the same mindset as we were, fucking just let her in or we're going to get grief. And she turned out to be, uh, uh, obviously, uh, men mentally challenged and was nothing to do with Prince Andrew and she was left to wander around his private his private apartment his private house before she was found uh, and restrained mm -hmm. so obviously 
to meet the royal family, you must be vetted. Like you must have. Yeah, you go through so kind of tourism. Things, but come on, you, yeah. Was Jimmy Savile ever in the palace? Yeah, when you I, were see there? Him, I see him coming once. Uh, he came in running running gear. Just coming in running gear, like really small shorts on. Uh, it was actually a funny bloke. Do you know what I mean? And we didn't think anything of it. This time we grew up with this fella, but he did look a bit out of place. I mean, he was going in to see Prince Charles, I think. Um, but yeah, he um, he uh, he was a regular. Regular visit. I've seen him a couple of times. Re remember once, but yeah, he was a regular visitor. So why do you think all these sex cases and oh, people like Epstein and Jimmy oh, Savile yeah. are allowed inside Buckingham Palace or allowed to be around? Well, you think, you, you, at the end of the day, they can have who they want. The bottom line is they can have who they want in. You know what I mean? We can't tell them not to have people. It's like Prince Andrew going to see Epstein. Now, he's a convicted paedophile. Now, my issue with that is, and, and you'd say the same, if one of your friends where he's abroad, you found out they'd done this and he just got out of jail for it. You'd ring him up and say, delete my number and fuck right off and put the phone down. You wouldn't travel 3,000 miles and then spend three days to say goodbye to him, would you? You know? And that was a big issue because he's a senior member of the royal family. Why the fuck was he allowed or, or, or why did he make sure that he was able to go and visit this individual? Because there'd have been a lot of security checks in place for him. You know, you'd have... Uh, the, the the travel we've got like a, a section within royal protection that deals with all the travel for roles and all the rest of it so they will liaise with local police wherever they go and make sure they know where the local hospitals is the local police stations just if there was an emergency same with if they go abroad he's a senior member of the royal family therefore he, wherever he goes needs to be vetted he needs to know where he's going who he's going to visit so they can contact the local police they can do the checks on the premises to make sure it's not owned by the fucking mafia or Russian state or anything like that where it could be bugged and cameras um, and they'd, che and they'd obviously check out it was coming back to, to Epstein and obviously they'd say that he's coming to visit Epstein and it would flag up it would say but he's a convicted felon you do know that and they'd go back to Rory and they'd say uh, yeah, yeah, um, sir do you do know and he's it, obviously gone I'm going he's obviously gone against advice for whatever reason that is there's obviously something there that he was frightened was going to come out or Epstein was going to say about him and that's why he's gone otherwise there's no good reason that the excuse he came up with it was absolute tosh you know there's something what it is i don't know but he's worried about epstein had, had knowledge of something he's, he, he'd done because I, i've spoke to a few people when we talk about touch on the craze who are listening what yeah. roughly fucking nonsense as well that yeah. but they had information on politicians that's why they never get sent to prison until mm. somebody burned the evidence and then mm. they end up getting life sentence as far yeah. as i'm aware yeah do you think epstein had something on prince andrew where potentially he tried to keep him yeah. sweet because epstein would have been a mass manipulator yeah like i say andrew's not the, the smartest tony shed do you think epstein's been feeding him women possibly maybe not girls maybe just women yeah, partying I mean, and he's got yeah. video footage or because if you're on that island yeah. Yeah, with yeah. clintons and mm. woody allens and mm. high up profile yeah. names like yeah listen a lot of people might have just been thinking free holiday or mm. whatever mm. but there was rumours of Epstein way back in the seventies. I think he was a math teacher and he was mm. being inappropriate with young girls. So it was always there, same as Jimmy yeah. Savile. There was always rumours there. I think yeah. uh, Johnny Rotten outed him away back mm. in the nineties. I think they'd done an mm. interview. But do you think Epstein had something over Prince Andrew? Pot potentially. I mean, that's how it appears to be for the way Prince Andrew has acted by going to New York to visit him. You know what I mean? To do that and, and obviously the shitstorm that was created out of that visit. To do that, there must have been something Prince Andrew was worried about. Any logical person, if you, you always say, would a reasonable person do this, that, and the others? Well, would a reasonable person go and visit a convicted sex offender? No, you wouldn't, especially in the position that this, this person was, a senior member of the royal family. You would not do it. You would be advised not to go. Mm -hmm. And yet he went. So, uh, you know, there is, there is definitely, I've always said he's got questions to answer, but he'll never have to answer them. So did you ever see kids coming in to no. the palace because i had yeah. someone on a police whistleblower mm. he spoke about ted Heath, who was a mm. prolific nonce mm. he was a prime minister he says two of the coppers used to bring kids as young as 10 in to see ted Heath. yeah one of the kids end up snapping and saying i'm straight but the two kids get sacked or yeah. they get sacked no no kids um as i say it was just it's just it was all women in their early to late 20s um you know, we never we never saw anything or any females. We'd think, "Oh, does your mum know where you are?" Do you know what I mean? It was it was just straight um, normal individuals. What know? about Glenn Maxwell? Was she ever there? All the time. She was well. So all the time. I've already publicly said that she she had the sort of the run of the palace. You know, she was in 
in and out very frequently and to the point where we actually thought they were in some form of relationship um you know no one else had the sort of access to the palace as she did and that's what gave us the impression that there was a relationship going on uh, we were just told to wave her through um and not not sort of get involved when she was coming into the palace so but it's strange though again she's just been done for trafficking like how these people are all <coughs> connected with it like I just think the issue you've got with Prince Andrew, what he's got, is six or seven of his closest friends are convicted now convicted sex offenders. You know, I mean, one individual that say you know it suddenly you'd found out was an, but half a dozen is that's you know what I mean. What the fuck's going on? Um, and that's the issue he faces. I mean, he's never going to come back into public life. Um, and as I said, just because he's got a title, it doesn't mean that he's not. A, you know, uh, let me start that again. Just because he's got he's got a title after his name doesn't mean he's a, he's a good person. You know, he's proved himself to be uh, less than honourable on so many levels. Um, you know, why are we having to look after this idiot? He's 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 damaged the royal family, uh, you know, badly. I mean, the Harry and Meghan situation that's none of my business, but you know, that's another issue. But the royal family, as, as it's now the Queen's gone, it's it, you know, it's it's starting to crumble. You know, it's starting to just just deteriorate into mm -hmm. into something that's. Uh, I think people are going to be more supportive of the anti-monarchist sort of situation. What did you think of the princess? Uh, what did you think of Prince Andrew's interview? The interview with Prince Andrew is clear that he was lying on on a number of levels. Um, I mean, that was that was a mad thing to do. I actually think he the, because he's been brought up in this bubble when he's never heard the word no, they actually believed he could pull it off. You know, and that he was that we would believe everything he said. Um, it was complete nonsense, complete and utter nonsense, and that's what killed him. And that's probably uh, the court case that that would have been brought up in the court case had it gone to court. Um, you know, the, the 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 main person who would have been uh, the the sort of uh, the one that's going to bring him down was himself because of the things he said. You know, I don't sweat. Yeah. Who would have green lighted that interview? He did. He, he that, that's what I'm saying. No, no one's going to say no to Prince Andrew. Yeah, uh, he would have green lighted that himself. He would have thought it was the right thing to do. I mean, uh, I've said it publicly as well. I mean, to, to, to publicly defend a relationship with a convicted convicted paedophile, I mean, that's just disrespecting survivors of abuse all around the world. It's, it just shows his uh, mentality. You know that that he's he's not even thinking about what he's saying. You know what I mean? And the world's watching and you're talking you're talking like that. So he said he didn't swear. He went to see Epstein because he didn't want to be a chicken to break up with a, a convicted a convicted paedophile. Yeah. Like he says he went to a pizza shop with the night of was it Roberts? Do, do, mm. what's her name? Yeah, Virginia Jeffrey. Yeah, Virginia Roberts. Uh, yeah. Like, so what age was this girl? Seventeen? Seventeen, I believe, yeah. 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 Um and she says she was trafficked to went with Andrew right. three times. Like, what's your whole rundown on it all? What's your opinion on Prince Andrew, think, Epstein, if, Maxwell? If we, if we put it, if we put it like this, if 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 it was one of us, our feet wouldn't have touched the ground. We'd have been interviewed about about what the allegations that were made by this individual. Um, but it never happened. Um, I think Prince Andrew's there's something that Prince Andrew has done that's clear that there is an issue. He's got an issue. Um, and also, I look at the fact that if again if uh, someone has made a, an allegation which you're saying is is a malicious allegation against the, the royal family a member of the royal family the royal family surely would have pulled together and used every you know uh, legal uh, framework that they had and power that they had to defend the individual against this this allegation but they never they basically left him left him to it and, I, and I'm pretty sure that the Queen and Prince Charles were the ones that told him to pay the money um, because he, if he'd have gone to court, he would have just talked himself into the electric chair. You know, he would have just, he would have just been ripped to pieces. But I didn't think royal, f royal family could ever go to court. So why were they even answering questions? Because I know some countries yeah. you can't even speak yeah. out no, against. I think, the yeah, royalties, I, I you mean, go to prison. I think, um, you know, it, 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 it can be questioned. You know, he could have been questioned about, about what had happened, about the allegations that were made against him, but he wasn't. You know, if the Metropolitan Police deemed that legally that they, they didn't have the, uh, didn't have the framework to, to to interview him, even a voluntary interview. I mean, he did say that he talked to the FBI, but then he never, 
you know? If you're innocent, you're going to be fucking shouting it for the rooftops. You're going to be saying, listen, I'll, of course I'll, I'll um, support your investigation. Of course I'll come forward and talk to you because um, I've done fuck all wrong, you know? Why are you hiding behind your, your legal team? If that's really what you, you, you're telling us, that you, this is the truth, then defend yourself, you know? Don't hide behind a, a payment and then, and then start gobbing off again. You know, at the end of the day, he's, he's gone too far. He's, he's, you know, he's been connected with too many bad, bad people and he just needs to disappear and, and stay at the limelight. So see when he goes out of Buckingham Palace, like, I think how, exactly. no, how I think well they've kicked him out. Yeah, but how well were they protected when they go out, like security well, wise? And... He would have had a couple of PPOs with him. Uh, probably one. <clears throat> if it's an official engagement, he might have uh, a PPO and a, and a backup, a car with four backups in it. Um, but if it's a private engagement, he'd just have one one PPO with him, protection officer. Um, but now I think I don't know whether I, I did say before. Um, the Queen had passed away, that they'll slim the royal family down. And um, I think his security has been uh, slimmed down. I don't know if he's, if he's got civilian security now. I don't even know if he's got armed protection anymore. What's it like at a private event with the royal family? Um, well, with it, you just get loads of heads. Of, you know, I've, I've been there when President Bush has came in on a Black Hawk helicopter. I've been there when Putin was there and his security team. Um, Chinese premier there's a, there's a big security you can imagine those kind of people come to the palace there's massive security uh, presence who had the biggest security with them? oh the Bush he had fucking loads you know they had handheld stinger missiles apparently in the back of the car they had people on rooftops all in different buildings for fucking miles have you got a license to kill? Have I got a license to kill? Yeah. Not a license to kill. I, I, when you when you carry a farm, as an off, an AFR, obviously you you you've got a certain list of rules. Most of them I've, I've forgotten there, but obviously you're there to protect life and protect property. So if there's a situation where if you don't act, someone could get killed or you could get killed, then obviously you're duty bound to to, to use your weapon. Mm -hmm. um, and if someone gets killed, then you're going to have to justify it. You Was know? Harry and William ever at the palace when you were there? I'd seen them when they were kids. They were young. <clears throat> they were at St James's when I used to work. At, I used to work at different palaces, and they were lovely kids. They'd always come and talk to the police um, and just wave. And you know, they were they were more down to earth. Do you know what I mean? They didn't have that sense of entitlement mm -hmm. that the, the, the senior roles did. And you know, Prince Charles had a sense of entitlement. Then he's the future heir to the. It was the future heir to the throne. You know, Prince Anne was the same. But the kids were sort of different. They were a lot more. Mm -hmm. More friendly because obviously you've got the Prince Harry and Meghan Markle thing now, and I yeah. thought it was quite noble at the start. I thought because I like Princess Diana, I thought yeah. amazing mm. woman, mm. and I thought you know what he's trying to look after his wife and his kids. But mm. then I seen them do interview after interview, Netflix, books, <sighs> yeah. and uh, podcasts, and I'm thinking, is this is he been manipulated? It looks for my judging of appearance and way I see it as mm. I feel as if he's been manipulated by her, um, and he, both of them have just kind of forgot who they are mm. well not her specifically I don't know if she's pulling the strings but what do you think the whole I, Harry I, and Meghan thing I think he's come across as a quite an angry an angry bloke that's got a lot of got a lot of issues and he's gone and heard him in public I mean you know it, it's not for us to say whether that's right or wrong in terms of if that's his personal feelings and he wants to shout to the world what he's done I think the issue with some people is the money that's being made out of that yeah um, I, I, that's what I personally think. Obviously, they're making a lot of money. Um, so is his, is his grief uh, being commercialised? You know, is he, is he genuinely this, this you know, upset? Um, and he probably is because he's, you know, he's been through a lot. Um, but then obviously you've got the, 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 the amount of money that's being made. So it's a, it's a, it's a fucking hard one to sort of work out what, mm -hmm. what's right and what's wrong. For him, it's right. But maybe for the royal household, it's wrong. Yeah. The royal family, it's wrong. You know, he, he's he's gone down that path, man. There's no turning back. So you know, he's he, he he's going to have to deal with the situation. Yeah, I can't see why he's, he left and tried to protect his wife. I get it if it's yeah. to do with his mum. Yeah, but I don't know if he's maybe been manipulated to then. Yeah. They're saying they want a peaceful life, but then they're doing books and they're speaking out against. Like, they're speaking out against his brother. Like that's yeah. no matter what's happened. Like you don't speak out against your brother. Like that's yeah. a sin I mean, in its own. Like. What was that? What was the Queen like? She was a really nice lady. She was, uh, you know, um, I'd spoken to a number of. Well, you don't speak to the Queen. She speaks to you. I mean, some people get young with that. So, oh. but that's that's how it was. You know, she's she served the country for a long period of time, but she treated her staff with respect. Yeah, um, one of her footmen was a raving alcoholic, um, and 
he would sometimes turn up to to open the doors for him when she came back uh, from from visiting from doing visits, and he'd be drunk, but she'd ignore that. She'd ignore that fact, and just she knew what he was like. Um, one time he came in, and the Queen was five minutes away, and he came staggering towards us in his penguin outfit. He had too much. Uh, he goes, I need to go through the garden gate to to wait for the Queen. I said, hold up, you're, you're you're off your face. We can't let you go in like that. I called up the inspector, come there. He said, she knows what he's like, let him in. So he staggered across the fucking gravel forecourt at the palace, they let him in the garden gate, and he was there waiting for the Queen when she came out and opened the door for her. Yeah. You know, if that was somewhere else, he'd get the sack, wouldn't he? Yeah. But because she, she's, she's loyal to her staff, she just ignored it. Do you know what I mean? Does the staff, as they see when people make the food and stuff in the Buckingham Palace, like, do people have to test that and no. eat it first, or is it just no, a... No, no I, don't, I don't believe it. I've never seen that anyway. I've never seen that. She's got her own private chefs, and um, I think there's three, there's three different, um, sort of for the staff, there's three different restaurants. You've got the upper class, which is all the senior members of the whole household have got their own restaurant. Then you've got the middle tier, and then you've got the obviously the, the waitresses and the footmen and all that. At the, at, the, at the lower level mm -hmm. I probably just got a fridge and a fucking microwave <laughs> yeah. but but yeah no it, you know it, the food side of things uh, it's obviously the, one of the best chefs she's got there isn't she do you know what I mean what was Charles like I didn't really see him that much he's a bit aloof a bit aloof he, he, he wasn't really uh, uh, I'd never seen him like on the grounds as such he did knowledge just every now and again do you know what I mean um, but it wasn't it wasn't horrible to me or anything like that you know I'm not going to disrespect to people that you know, I've that that have haven't done anything to me, or I've not I've not sort of got the vibe. Do you know what I mean? But mm -hmm. he, um, but he, he seemed right. I think he's just he's the heir to the throne. He was brought up in a certain way. They're old fashioned. They expect to be looked after, and be served. That's that's how they were. Yeah, I know there's a lot of negatives with that job as well, but there must have been positive. What was the what was the perks of working in Buckingham Palace? Obviously, you get well paid. You get well paid for it. There's no stress. You know, you you you're, you're not dealing with with, with you know the stuff that I've mentioned before when I was, when I joined the police. You're dealing with just just protection. Um, you know, I mean, you get to you get to meet all kinds of people and celebrities and stuff like that, and um, it's just just standard, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? You you can put your head on your pillow at night and not have to worry about paperwork, court, or whatever else. What sort of celebrities did you come across? Oh, flipping hell! Uh, one who was a bit of a tall was Elton John. He turned up one day because I was doing uh, the party in the palace. You know, it was the Jubilee in 2002 and he was coming in to, to look at something on the grounds or something. And a Bentley turned, was it a Bentley or something turned up and the driver was there and he said, yeah, Mr. Elton John. I went, right, I need, obviously need to see him because I don't know the fuck you are, but I know you're not Elton John. So he opened the window and I said, uh, afternoon, so he just looks at me and looks away. I thought, you wanker, <laughs> not even a hello. I thought, oh, do you know what? Um, and yeah, so he, he was he wasn't all that, but um, Brian May was in there because he did the stood on the roof. Um, oh, do you know what? There's, there was loads of people I've met. I just can't reel them off my head now. Mm -hmm. But yeah, most of them were pleasant by and large. What's the worst thing you've seen in Buckingham Palace? The worst thing I've seen. Um, well, apart from that domestic incident, um, I haven't really seen any. When you say worst thing, um, no, I can't. No. Well, give me an example just like did you see any bad stuff like or was it just all kind of normal just yeah no day -to -day yeah, no, it, was, yeah it was just normal stuff doing mm. their jobs there wasn't really any bad stuff per se that went on in there do you know what i mean yeah it was pretty standard so what's your whole rundown on the prince andrew thing like, like what's your whole opinion of him I, right basically that he, he, he just needs to stay out of the public life now he's done he's done stick a fork in you you're done do you know what I mean? He's, he's got no place in public life. He's said too much and he's done too much. You know, the Epstein visit was one of the nails in the coffin. The interview was the other nail in the coffin. Uh, the association with over six or more uh, convicted sex offenders. Do you know what I mean? I mean, we could go on and on and on. He's, he's, he's had 30 years of living a hedonistic lifestyle and it's come on top for him. Why? Because he's never listened to any advice. Mm -hmm. um, and he's not, I don't think he's ever going to change. Um, and no one really wants to see him back in any sort of position uh, within the royal family. Um, who's going to want him to come and cut a ribbon on their business? He, he, you know, no one. Um, so I don't, I don't see there's any way back for him. Um, I mean, he's probably going to try and fight too for now to claw something back, but I don't think it's going to work. Public opinion is so far against him. I can't see him getting, getting anywhere. What's your opinion on the Epstein death? 
again, I, you know, was it, a lot of people. I'm, I'm sort of uh, one of these people. Are, you look at the facts. You know, we assume this and we assume that, and people say this, people say that. But what are the actual facts? The trouble you have is when you're dealing with with powerful people in that sort of environment, that the facts sort of seem to get lost. Do you know what I mean? They sort of get lost, and you get a lot of fucking um, supposition, as it were. So, um, was it? Did he commit suicide? I think probably. I think probably. Do you think so? Mm. What about the stuff that you're doing now, Paul? I know you're doing a lot of charity work. Let's touch on that. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I've, as I said to you, I'm doing this interview to try and highlight a charity called Embrace Sevop, which is child mm. victims of crime, and um, it's a small charity, and it basically helps children that have been directly or indirectly affected by crime and their families, uh, includes counselling and stuff like that. Um, so if people uh, could could Google it Sevop and, um, and maybe donate something for these people, it make a, make a difference to, to to kids that need help. It really would. And how can people get involved? Um, if you go onto their website, Sevoc, embrace, embrace Sevoc, um, and there's lots of ways you can get involved. You can do charity events if you want, or you can donate. Um, so it's uh, you can get involved. Just mm. just go on the site, and there's there's all the connections you need to yeah. to go and move forward. What about plans for the future, brother? What you what you got planned? I'm, I've got, I've got a TV work coming up. Um, whether I, I decide to do it or not, I haven't I haven't chosen that. I, I think I'm pretty much done. Now. I've said what I wanted to say about prince andrew it's the truth um and there's nothing else i can say about that you know i can't add to it i can't take away because it's out there and there mm -hmm. but i just think people uh, my issue was i just think people should look at the, look at the facts of what i've said about this individual um in all kinds of media that work the tv stuff that i've, I've done and form form their own opinion yeah, of look at the situation, what he's got himself involved in, look at the man himself, look at the people that have come forward to talk about what, what kind of individual he is and then make up your own mind. Do you have a worry for your life? No. no. How so? I just think it's one of them things, isn't it? You know? Because speaking out against such a powerful family. Yeah, I know. I'm, and, uh, I mean, I've got a lot of support from other police officers and former Royal Protection Officers, but they are in fear of coming forward and, and telling, inf giving information out what they've got. Um, and so, you know, I've put some of the stuff out there. I've been used as a pipeline to sort of get it out there because they're too frightened because the Masonic influence within the police was big. And obviously if a Royal Protection Officer speaks out, if they've got a business or say it could be damaged, you know, because people, people might say, oh, he's, you know, he's gobbling off about the Royal Family. And that's what happened. A lot of people are frightened because they don't want to get, you know, uh, the attention drawn onto them and negative attention. Have you ever been discredited yet? Like no. writing negative posts up in the papers or oh yeah I mean I get I get no what happens is uh, obviously I you know I went to prison for fraud um and obviously it's saying I deserve I deserve to get my sentence probably should have got a longer sentence if, if I'm going to be honest with you um you know I made a lot of bad decisions they weren't mistakes they were decisions that I made conscious decisions which were completely and utterly wrong and it affected a lot of people um but at the time I I'd I got myself in so much financial sort of debt you know millions that I, I tried to trade my way out of it, it on the stock market and I lied to people and I took people's money uh and told them it was all good when it wasn't I just didn't have the courage I didn't have the backbone to stand up and say look it's all gone fucking wrong I had a reputation I'd become a millionaire while I was in royal protection so you know I had a lot of money and people trusted me because I was driving around in 80,000 pound cars you know um and um I had a luxurious lifestyle um and basically what happened was I uh I took a hit in the markets, decided to, to, to create a currency club, put a lot of police officers' money in. The, we were dealing with millions. And um, I went from buying shares to trading um, spread betting. And spread betting is basically gambling. Well, we started the stock market, but <clears throat> the difference is when you buy a share, it's got to go up to make money. Spread betting is you can bet on markets to go up or down, so you can make money in the markets going down as well as up. And so if I had, I was trading, when I was doing my own thing, I was doing a million pound a month from Buckingham Palace, trading on my fucking phone on a teletext. Yeah. Um, and I had my own dealer with Halifax, you know, I had a half a million pound credit limit with them. And I, so I could buy shares on credit and not have to pay for them from 28 days. I was making 20 grand a week sometimes, 30 grand a week. Um, so the money sort of, uh, it, it dehumanizes you because you're dealing with so much money. And then all of a sudden I got a kick, a bad kick. I managed to get out of about 80 or 90 grand, so I lost a lot of money. 
And um, and then I went into this, went, I thought I could do it in the spread betting. But if you put £10,000 in, and this is important for people who are doing this, you put £10,000 in an account, you can trade up to £100,000 because you get leverage 10 times the amount you put in. Le what that means is that you can trade £100,000, but if markets go against you, you're going to lose a lot of fucking money. Um, and I started off all right. We started making money. And then it went fucking tits up. Um, and uh, I just, I just, like I said, instead of having the guts to say to people that it's all gone wrong, I, I continued in in a corrupt way, um, and and it, it just come on top. I ended up having a contract put out on me. You know, I, I got locked up in Pentonville for fucking six weeks for witness intimidation on police. Um, I mean, that was that was an eye opener. Obviously, getting locked up. I was a serving police officer, and I'm put in Pentonville prison. And I was there for the first the first day, and I got in with a fellow who was from a gang in South London, and uh, we got on like a house on fire, and um, uh, I was in the I was in the canteen, um, queuing up for my food, and they took your name off on this list, and this guy's looks he goes Page Paul Page, it's your fucking old bill, yeah, wouldn't you? I was like fuck, all right. So you could hear a pin drop. There's like about 10 geezers behind me. I'm in the thinking, what the fuck am I going to... I haven't got a radio now to go urgent assistance. I'm on my own. So I thought, right, I've got to think quick. So I went, who the fuck are you talking to? Mate? I'm in here for witness intimidation, which I was. He goes, oh, and he started. And I said, what do you want to do about it then, mate? Yeah, I said, I, I said I'm not old fucking Bill. You said he can't. So because he did, wasn't too sure, he's like, oh, is, he went, all right, brother, all right, I made a mistake. All right, calm down. So all right, you fucking calm down. So I went back to my cell and... <laughs> I said to Joel, the, the fellow I was there, was like, oh, fuck. And then, uh, so I was even dead. He goes, what's that about? I said, ah, fuck it. Well, fuck all, mate. Don't worry about it. So anyway, we all get locked up and all the, all the canteen boys are still out clean. And I, anyway, he's gone back to his cell. got a fucking newspaper. My picture's in it, isn't it? So half a dozen of them have come up. They've banged on the cell, died in the flat. I'm going, oh, you cunt. Put it. <laughs> See, that's you, innit? I was like, ah, oh, fuck. So Joel was like, oh, mate, what are we going to do? They're going to think I'm a grass. So sitting there, but because we got on, I said, listen. He, go, he said, he goes, I've got, I've got people upstairs. My, my cousin runs the, runs the shit in here. He goes, I said, right, I'll sort out some money for him. I'll put some, a few quid in his account, get him to the government. He said, yeah, we'll do that. Anyway, six o'clock in the morning, about four or six girls, I can't remember, big fuckers, they were a couple of cells. Don't page, get your stuff. You're going on the, uh, what are they, this, you're going on the fucking roll. Protection. Yeah, you're going, yeah, you're going on the VP wing. I went, no, I'm fucking not. I went, yes, you fucking are. Like, I was I, was, I, think, I said, no, I'm not. I said, he's my witness. I said, you put me on that wing, yeah? I'm going to stab the first person I come across in both eyes. I said, so I'm, there's a witness there now. So if I go on that wing, I'm putting you in the frame for that. He goes, are you telling us you're a danger to have a prison? I went, yeah, I fucking am. Sex cases and nonsense. I said, I'm not living with him. So they said, all right, you'll have to go on the block. If you're dangerous to have a prison, we'll put you on a punishment block. And I said, yeah, and if anyone's ever been to Pentonville, you know that's the worst place to fucking be. It's a shit hole. The prison's a shit hole anyway. But the, the, uh, the, the punishment blocks in, in the fucking basement. And uh, so I might, got marched down there. And they stuck me in it and it was fucking horrible. And there was all bog rolling in the fucking walls down the sink. And I was like, what's this nut I've done? Who's been in this cell? So what you do is when you get a cell, you clean it. You've got to clean it because there's all kinds of piss and all kinds of bodily fluids that are, you know what I mean? You just clean, this, clean your cell. No telly or nothing like that. You're in a punishment block, you got to fuck off. So I cleaned this cell up, took all the paper out the fucking walls and all that. It took me ages, right? And I was asleep at about two in the morning. And I was like, I could hear something rattling in my fucking, I think someone was on my noodles, yeah? So what the fuck's that? And then run across my face. I put the lights on. I've got fucking cockroaches everywhere, all over me, in my fucking food. I was like, fuck's sake. Now I don't realise why the fucking bog roll was in the, so I had to spend the next hour and I'm putting all the fucking bog roll back in the gaps in the wall, stopping from coming through. But yeah, it was horrible. It was like mm. fucking, and they kept coming to me every couple of weeks. So I was in there for six weeks on the block. But every week the governor would come and say, oh, you shouldn't be down here. Because I was a serving police officer still. And I think they were worried. They said, look, why don't you go on the VP wing? We'll keep... I said, I'm not going on. So I ended up, I collected a load of cockroaches. And you know, you have the IAGs, the independent advisory. You've got these people, that come around like, going, oh, you're all right. How's prison? How's this? You know, like from outside the community and all the rest of it. So I kept saying to this governor, if you don't leave me alone and keep asking me to go on the nonsense room, I'm going to want to see these people and show them all the fucking cockroaches that you've got running around in here and the rats that are running past my window. She said, all right, all right, no problem, no problem. Stay there, stay there. So I, I rode it out for fucking six weeks in the block and then I managed to get bail. So would you have a gambling addiction? Well, they, they said I had a gambling addiction. I'm not going to use that as a fucking excuse. 
Do you know what I mean? It was mm -hmm. it was a factor, a contributory factor as I see it in, in my downfall. Yeah. But unfortunately what happened was because I was dealing with so much money, I lost the sense, the value of money. And um and so if you know, if you had a hundred thousand pounds on this table now and I took half of it away, you'd think, fuck me, I've lost half half the money. But if it's on a screen, you don't it doesn't register that you're losing that kind of money. Um and I just went into this mode and the amount of money because what what I looked at, I, it, when it went wrong, I thought, fuck, I've had this nice life, you know, um, and I'm, I'm going to let my family down, I'm going to lose everything. I've, I've, you know, what am I going to do? I've, and, and I, instead of just dealing with that situation head on, I, I went the wrong way. And I tried to gamble my way out of that situation with other people's money. How much did you lose? Three million pound of other people's money and two million a month, so about five mil, you know. Um, and it's it's something that it's a, it's a bit of pill I have to swallow every fucking day when I wake up and realise. So I used to be well respected. I was, a, you know, people say, oh, he's probably a wank of what he's done in his job. But I was, a, you know, I, I did I did a lot of good things in in the place, and I've done you know bad things as I've said. Um, but I, I turned into this. Now I said you bent for the job, and then bent for yourself, mm -hmm. and then I turned bent for myself, and you know, and I corrupted other police officers. I mean, I had fucking uh, when we were at the the the, uh, the syndicate, I was sending hundreds of thousands of pounds in police cars to different police stations to pay out police officers. In fact, it went up and down the country, up in Scotland at the time, if it was Police Scotland, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. That was the force. You know, people up there, all the way down Greater Manchester. So I was sending people that going up to Barrymore with loads of money on them to buy them off for their monthly, quarterly earnings they were getting off me. It was like, it turned into a big fucking pyramid scheme, you know, like a Ponzi scheme. Not intentionally. I, I never knew what that was. The at the time. kind of thing. People putting money in and getting it out, and then every couple of months. I was sending money, hundreds of thousands of pounds in police officers' accounts. They were drawing it out, and I was throwing it across in armed police cars with the blue lights flashing to get across town to get to the fucking other neck. Do you ever remember the heart scheme? Yeah, people oh, used to put a grand in, and that, then that, once that, you move down, you get eight yeah, grand that, at the that, end. That, that came into royal protection at the time, and mm. the individuals that run that, the police officers, um, asked me because at the time I was the money god. You know, I was driving, like I said, in fucking seriously expensive cars and going on nice holidays it was all my money at the time do you know what I mean? and then obviously they come up to me oh do you want to pump this tell the boys because i listen to you and i looked enough i was a bit pants so i put a few quid in myself and said well it's ain't no wet tits up um and the individuals the, the officers that were involved in that we uh <laughs> basically one of them got taken off taken off the unit moved to windsor overnight because they found out there was a plot to smash the fuck out of him <laughs> which there was but other old bill were going to beat the shit out of him because they'd lost about 80 or 90 grand in total but um, so what was the corporal's doing just putting money into they what? were putting this heart in the hearts the heart, yeah, yeah, and yeah. it just all went bandy mm -hmm. um and so the, they made money the two royal cops who the ones at the start would have made yeah the they made the dough we done it in glasgow us, yeah i mean that's it but you but you know what at the end of the day I, phew, they didn't they didn't fuck up as bad as i did you know and uh, uh, but I always, one of these people that I say, if you dish it out, you better be pre prepared to take it. So, you know, I've, I've said what I've done in the job and then it's come back full circle and bit me in the fucking ass. When was this? That happened in 2000 and I think 2003, it started going pear shaped. Um, and then I got convicted in 2009. Um, and, I, you know, I had a contract put out on me because I took some money. I didn't realise it was from serious criminals. I took some money and fucking... Um, it all went wrong, so they put a contract out on me. Um, and I ended up nearly killing a son photographer because I thought he was a fucking hit man. And I had to go to court for that. Um, and I put a gun in his head and, mate, it was just all wrong. I was, I was just going downhill, my mental state. I wasn't I wasn't off my head, but I, I, my capacity to think straight had, had gone by this time. Do you know what I mean? Were you taking gear, booze? No, a drink, yeah. I never took gear, only steroids when I was in prison. But, um, yeah, drinking a lot drinking a lot you know my, my, my capacity to think straight was was gone where did you leave the royal family for uh basically because i was doing all this this um the, uh, the currency club it was called you know or it was cash it was a bit it was naughty we shouldn't have been doing it at royal protection you know i was turning up in my range rover and i've got a black range rover the two range rovers and a porsche and i was I, I basically i took leave from the job but what happened was they put my file down the back of the back of the fucking cupboard so no one knew where I was or what the fuck I was doing. Everyone knew what I was doing, but if management turned up, they didn't know what, what was going on. So, because uh, it got to the stage where I was I was paying people to work for my shift. I was paying people £300 a day, coppers, to, to come 
instead of work being off, come and work my shift so I can fuck off onto the markets. You know, and it was uh, we was using police police resources. As I said, one time we I had uh, I had to take some money. Was some fellow who's worth a hundred million was involved with me, and he put money in, and um, his contact who I knew, I had to give him fifty grand, and he, it was, we was late, so I needed to get this money up to him. So I met him in uh, I met him in um, uh, a shopping centre in uh, Beckton car park. And I brought a police area car with me, BMW with two officers in it. And I gave this fella the 50 grand and I said, just in case you get mugged on the way to London, they're going to follow you. So I used that, that got that car to follow him to Limehouse Link. They've got another police car on the other side to escort him the rest of the way into, into the way he needed to go. You know, I mean, it's fucking mental what we were doing. <laughs> fucking mental, do you know what I mean? Just it's to make uh, sure that money weren't going anywhere but where yeah. it needed to go. What was the most that went through? I used to have about 150, 200 grand on my floor, putting in envelopes. I mean, the neighbours used to joke, say he's got more police cars on his driveway than the local Nick because it'd become people coming, taking envelopes for their money and all the rest of it. And it was, it just got fucking out of hand. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And we just lost, that's the trouble. Money, money, money is the root of all evil. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And the stock market's the devil's casino. It turned you in for a half decent individual like I thought I was, half decent, into a complete fucking slime ball. Yeah, you know I've, I mean? listen, I've been a gambler. Like, yeah. I've done it I for mean, I, I over 20 lost, years. I once lost £80,000 on online fucking uh, roulette. Easy done. In one night, I was yeah. pissed. Uh, you know, I think... I, I was doing property. If I'd have just stuck to property, I would have been all right. It's greed though, isn't it? It's something... I wouldn't even say greed because no matter how much you want, it goes straight it's, back. It's, it starts off as ambition, right? Then it turns to obsession. Then it turns to greed. And then ultimately addiction. That's the way I sort of processed what happened to me mm -hmm. and um I, I i i still as i say i've got no one else to blame but my fucking self um and um you know prison probably saved my life because going to prison as a police officer that was that was the first occasion when i went to prison pentonville so i learned i learned a lot you know what i mean mm -hmm. how to survive there was no way I was ever going on a fucking nonsense wing. No fucking way. If I'm going to get leveled out, so be it. How can I look at my children in the eye when I've had to mix with them fucking scumbags? And as I've already described what I did in my time as a police officer to some of these individuals when I had the opportunity. So how am I then going to fucking go from that to living with these people just to protect myself? So when I got convicted at court uh, and they sent me down, I got put down in the cells. I was like, fuck's sake. And... Um, because what I did to get through the court case, I had a bottle of Sprite, but I was filling it up with fucking white wine every day. So I was sitting there listening to it because it was tough, listening to people, how you've let them down and what you've done. And it's, it was killing me inside. But I was, I was in denial. I was going, fuck off, I didn't do all that. I was in denial. Yes, I did everything. I did it. You know, I, I turned into a monster. I look back now and I think, fucking hell, who the fuck was that? But I was in court when it was in the papers every day. You know, my wife was in the dock with me for money laundering and she had fuck all to do with it. She had nothing to do with it whatsoever. I had more people, police officers and civilians running, like laundering money. My wife didn't do anything. Do you know what I mean? They bust my balls and said, listen, go quietly and we'll let your wife go. That's what they said to me. They fucking trying to blackmail me. That's why the Prince Andrew stuff come out because I was so angry that I thought, you know what? Fucking have some of that. You want to fight dirty, take the gloves off, let's go. You know, I've got plenty of information. You know, and I said to him, oh, he's fucking trying to get his colleagues. Into I'm not a snitch. I'm not a grass. Do you know what I mean? There's colleagues that are still in the police now, that are senior officers that, I've, uh, you know, that are there because I've kept my gob shut. At the end of the day, the officers that gave evidence against me were wounded. But I turned on him and I started saying things back. And I shouldn't, you know what I mean? Because I was, I was in denial. Because if you believe, say, long enough, you, you know, a lie long enough, it's, it's true all of a sudden, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And I'm lying about, oh, I didn't do this. I didn't do it. Fuck them. What about you did this, that and the others? I should have just gone, you know what? Um, and anyway, so I got guilty. Uh, my wife got off halfway through because I realised there was nothing. Well, why is my wife here? Why? I um, got sent down and I was in a cell um, with a fella, John, who's uh, just got done for £10 million VAT fraud. And if anyone knows, when you get done for VAT, you're going to get a shaft in. You know what I mean? And he got a six. Um... And he was such a nice bloke, but unfortunately, he's, he's crossed the vet man, hasn't he? And um, anyway, I was, and there was another fella, a big bloke, who was a, a PC from Hertfordshire. And he was a lump, right? He was like, oh, are you? He goes, oh, I'm fucked. He's all oh, corruption. He goes, but then I joined the job to be corrupt. 
I was like, you wanker. I said, I thought, ah. Oh. So anyway, I'm thinking, right, you're my, you're my wingman now, aren't you? We've got, I've got, we've got to work together. I said, listen, when we go to the big ass, you need to switch on, mate, because it's going to come thick and fast. All right? So he's going, what do you mean? Is this, you know, it, what, what he did was, he was that, that archetypical bent copper I told you about, bent for self from the off. And uh, he was going around nicking, nicking money when he's doing drugs raising, he was to put four grand in his pocket. Right, and uh, he goes to me. Uh, I said, "How'd you get fucking lifted then?" He goes, "I oh, didn't wank because anti-corruption." He said, "They're on me. I knew they're on me." And uh, I did this raid, and he goes, "There was money." And I knew. I said, "I knew they're on me, but I still took some money anyway." I thought, "Fuck it." I was like, "You're off. You're off key, aren't you?" I was fucking mad. He goes, "Yeah." And I was I was giving information to this drug dealer, and uh, he was doing. He was going robbing these people when we was divvying up the, the fucking gear and the money. He goes. But I, I, I knew they were following me. He said, I, I had his number on a cigarette box. He goes, and I thought, shit. So he's pulled over. He said, I'm going to go. And, I said, I said, I went to go in this off license, but I quickly threw the, the cigarette box in the fucking bin, yeah? Because that was the connection. He goes, when I've come out, got my car, went home. I was looking, oh, nothing, nothing. Four and six o'clock in the morning, I've gone straight through his door, boof, with a big red key. And I nicked him, took him back to the police station. He said, da, 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 interview him. And then I've got the cigarette box out. He goes, we found that in the fucking... Uh, your glove box of your car, mate. What you got to say about that? I mean, you fucking never found that in the glove box. It was in the bin. No, no it was in your glove box, mate. Fucking fitted, fitted him right up. But like I said, you fight five and five, innit? It was it? guilty anyway. It was guilty as fuck. So yeah. they, they fitted him up. He's, he was like, them dirty bastards. I said, mm. I said, what do you want about dirty bastards? What we've done? Yeah. I said, so anyway, we get put on the bus to Wandsworth. And, um, and bearing in mind, I've been like, guilty verdicts. Now I'm fucking... I swifted me straight off. I didn't get bail for, for reports or anything like that. I went, no, because I fucked the judge, judge, judge right off. You know, I'll, I'll terrorise him, I'll be honest with you, because I've been drinking this wine every day and just fucking gobbing off to the CPS and the anti-corruption Muppets who were sat next to me, I kept leaning and I was going, oh, wanker. Like, I've, I was abusing them, sunk, wrong. And, and I mean, to be fair, they were doing their job. I understand it, do you know what I mean? But I was in that, you know, I was off yeah, key. Lost. I was lost, yeah, I was gone. And... um so we get put on the bus to Wandsworth. It's all in the papers. It's on the news. Roll cops fucking been, um, you know, nutted off with a six. Whatever. In fact, I didn't get the fucking six then. I got I got remanded straight away. So anyway, me and me and uh, laughing boy, this corrupt fuckwit from uh, Hertfordshire and, and this John were on the bus and uh, we go to Wandsworth. They debus everyone else off except for me and me and matey boy because we're the two old bill, weren't we? So. Um, <laughs> they get us out they go come on you so they've cleared everyone else out now it's their turn fuck me them. it was like a bus busman's convention there was about 20 screws in they'll come to see the bad bad cops and they've and we've walked in one of them's gone behind the counter which one of you is page when i am goes i said take your going on the road and i you mate went fuck off i said you, I, was, I was pissed <laughs> so i've been drinking right i said you can fuck right off he goes oh you're a cocky one didn't you went yeah i fucking am and they were laughing at me they thought oh, wanker and i probably was uh, so I said, no, I'm not going on the road, neither is he. And I looked around at him and just, 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 I said, just fucking stay with me. And then we got put on a reception wing and uh, as I walked through, fucking hell, they were going, you big cunt, you fucking wanker, you're dead. And all this fucking... <laughs> and uh, well, was that when we... Actually, I don't know if that was not, not reception, that was when we went to the thing. But anyway, in reception, we've gone on our cells, right? And now he's starting to get shook, this big, big fellow. He's thinking, fucking hell, because now he's, he's in jail. Luckily, I said, luckily for me, I'd already had a bit of a turn at it, so I knew what the coup was. He's going, fucking hell. He goes, uh, what are we going to do? I said, right, break your fucking razor right now. <laughs> he goes, what? I said, break your fucking razor up, get that get that blade and start carving the bottom of your fucking toothbrush ASAP. I goes, what force have you going to need something? Because <laughs> if it goes off in there, mate, we're dead. So I, I just fucking started sharpening up my fucking bottom of my toothbrush big time. I said, get that fucking kettle on. Get that sugar, leave it next to the fucking kettle. He's going, what are you on about? I said, mate, I, I, at the time I was doing that, then I was making a wedge for the door, a uh, newspaper, soaking it up and making like a V-shape to put it under the fucking door, right? Because what you want to do is, if someone's going to come through your door, you want something there. You're not allowed to have wedges and all that, the screws tape, but you make out a paper. And I put it under the door just so enough, so you could, it'd be like that, yeah? So I'm thinking, if some fucker's coming through that door, they're only going to be able to do that. By that time... Sugar in the kettle, bosh, have that. Because I'm in survival mode now. I'm fucking, whatever, whatever streetwise situation I've got, it's, it's in here now, I'm fucked. And um, he's, he's starting to realise the gravity of the fucking situation. Do you know what I mean? You know, it was all big on the streets. 
lifting pe- drug dealers' money. And it was a big, big lump, and he thought it was a geezer. And I'm in, I'm in the old bill and all this fucking bollocks. Yeah. Now he's realising you're not in the old bill anymore. You're in jail, and the most hated people in jail were Peter Files, Grasses, and Old Bill. And he's like, "Fuck me!" He was, he was, he was, he was starting to wither. Do you know what I mean? But I think, listen, I need this cunt to watch my back. So I can't have him going pear-shaped on me. So anyway, as we're sitting there, the telly comes on. Who's on the BBC News? Fucking me. Oh, Royal Can't think, fuck's sake. Could it get any worse? Right? And uh, <laughs> so the next day we get put, oh, was it a week? I can't remember, a few days anyway. We get put on the fucking, the wing we're going to, A wing, B wing, whatever it was. But as I've walked through, they're on me, aren't they? They were going, you fucking cunt, you're dead, you fucking slag cunt. Right, like, fucking pig cunt and all that. I was like, Pff. just walking through for you, fuck's sake, I've really done it this time. He's behind me, but they don't say anything to him because they didn't know he was old Bill. They only knew I was old Bill because I'm on the fucking tell I'm in the papers. Do you know what I mean? And um, so that was his sort of that was his sort of safe thing, right? So he goes in the fucking throw into the wing, mate. Everyone's looking there. It's like shit. It's gonna come at any, you know what I mean? At any angle. I've got my my fucking thing ready to go. Or did I make another one? I can't remember. But anyway, I had it. I had one. And um, so we got put in a cell and um, got the kettle ready. So get that fucking kettle ready. Go and make the fucking wedge. Blah blah blah. I was put it under the door. And then the screw comes. Door goes. Oh, hey, Paige, come here. He goes. Hey, he goes. Oh, all good. It's a fucking bench screw, wasn't it? Straight over to me like that. Because anything you need, come and see me. I said, listen, I need to get a blow. I need to speak to my missus. They said, he said, come out, I'll take you upstairs and use my phone. Because I didn't have any pin credit. I said, anything you need, just to get me food and stuff like that. And um, so he looked after me, but he's going like, you watch your back, man, because they're all talking, they're all talking in here. I said, yeah, sweet, sweet, sweet. And uh, so we, we uh, again, the canteen situation, fuck's sake. So I've said to him, right, listen, you can't hide in the cell. You've got, you've got to get out there about because if you're hiding in your cell, this weakness, mate, you're going to get fucked. They don't know you right at the moment. They don't know me. So he's like, oh, mate. He's starting to shake. Now I said, right, we come back. We'll do a load of push-ups. Get the adrenaline out of your system. We we'll smash the push-ups out, right? And he's going, oh, mate. So we've gone to the canteen to get our food. Everyone's looking. Everyone's fucking on it. There's this thing. can't there. There's can't there. So I'm getting the food and then one of these geezers goes to me, ain't like that in the fucking police canteen, is it, mate? He slops my fucking food. I'm like, listen, you cunt. I have had to do it. What am I going to do? I'm either going to wither and die or I'm going to front it out and get a kick in. You know what I mean? Or worse. So I've said to him, who are you fucking talking to? You can't. I said, come round here and say that to me, you fucking prick. I've, I've had to. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't in the, you know, I wasn't being an hard man. I, was, I wasn't even frightened because I was so fucked off my head, out my head. I didn't know what, where I was, my emotions. And the screws just looked the other way and fucking walked away. I thought, you wankers. Because obviously I've been a cocky cunt downstairs and when I got booked in. So they thought, go on, cunt, have that. So anyway, it all went quiet. It all just went fucking quiet. And I look around and there's like 20 people looking at me. He's like, right. and I'm like, oh, fuck. Anyway, the geezer said to me, he goes, all right, calm down. Calm fucking down. I went, no, you fucking calm down. Anyway, I walked back to myself. By this time, mate, your boy's having a heart attack. He's going, fucking hell, so get the wedge, mate. They're coming. They're coming. All right, and he's shaking. He's fucking, I'm thinking, he's a big cunt. He's like 16 stones like that. And he's just turned into a complete fucking jelly. All right, so we're ready. We're ready now. Anyway. Um, this fella right around me has come to the door he goes hey bruv I said yeah what's up he goes listen uh, apologies for that you know fair play to you you know you got you, you know fair play so he put his hand through the gap and he I'm thinking I've got my shiv like ready to go and I'm thinking he's at but well, well, but he, he wasn't in a, a position he wasn't going to do it he was a melt do you know what I mean he wasn't going to get the water ready and I'm thinking do I shake the geezer's hand or do I upset him or what do I do in it typical fucking gambler I've gone now fuck it get in for a penny and for a pound. So I've shook his hand and it, it was all good because I was really, I was thinking, and it was all good. So I think, oh, okay, I fucking survived that little situation. What I didn't realise is this fellow is about six of them. They were in for serious armed robberies. <laughs> fucking, they were seriously naughty people. Mm. And I, they could have killed me, right? Because I wasn't mentally, I was in survival mode. And uh, like I said, they're probably a bit off key as well. Um, and then we went out into the yard and I said, mate, he goes, mate, you can't go out there, they're on you. I said, listen, if we don't fucking go out there, it's going to be 10 times worse. I said, like I said, they don't know the fuck you are, it's all on me. So he's going, oh, are you sure? We've got no choice. So we've gone out into the yard. John knew that, that Phil, I said, with a tax thing, he, he, uh, he come with us. And uh, we're walking around because you walk around in a circle, didn't you? The only time anyone crosses the yard is if someone's going to get a clump. And these four big black fellas come marching across towards me. I was like, ah, oh, fuck, here it is. 
this is where it's going to go off. I, I said, to, I went to say to this fucking idiot, go and you walk ahead of me. He'd already walked off. He'd fucked off and left me. Shake bag. Right? Whereas John, who bless him, he couldn't punch his way out of a wet paper bag. He said, no, I'll stay with you, Paul. I'll stay with you. I'm like, I'm shaking now. I know it's coming. I've, so I'm, I'm there ready to go bang. I go, yo, 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 you're that, you're that copper off the telly, aren't you? I went, yeah. Because did you know the queen? I went, yeah. He went, fucking hell. And I started shaking my hand, right? I was like, really? I couldn't believe it. Like, they were like, oh, you, you, you know the queen? And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I started chatting shit about the queen, mate, for <laughs> like fucking like <laughs> rapid, uh -huh. rapid. Um, because what it was, they'd seen the mansion and cars that uh, the BBC had built me up millions of pounds on this. So I wasn't a sort of, like, no disrespect, but I wasn't a numpty beat copper. Do you know what I mean? I, I come across as a big fish on the nose and the rest of it. And obviously, they're called a celebrity. You know what it's like when yeah, people yeah. in jail. And so I was like, oh, that didn't really register. Like, I'm a dirty pig in other right people's eyes. I'm, f oh, you know. So I started chatting about the Queen. And that was good as gold, right? So, oh, I've got a link there. Uh, and then anyway, silly bollocks comes back around and um, go back to the cell. And I said to him, do you know what, mate? I think, f f I'm gonna, I think the best thing for me to do for your safety is I'm going to fucking move cells. I said, because you could get weighed in. He goes, oh, would you? I thought, you can't. Do you know what I mean? He goes, oh, would you move? Like, oh, thanks, mate. It's like, really? No loyalty whatsoever. And I thought, oh, you wanker. So I fucked off outright. And I went in with John, bunked in with John. And I was chatting to these armed robbers and all the rest of it. And, and I was starting to move around, but be seen, but not heard. Do you know what I mean? Just, just you can't hide in yourself, especially you're like me. You're going to be a fucking target, mate. You've got to come out and, and at least show that you, you, you've got something about you. Um, I could have got weighed in at any time. I'm not saying I marched around the prison going, look at me. I'm saying I, that's what you got to do. It's fucking standard in position, my position. And um, he lasted a fucking day, this wanker, and went on the roll. They moved the nutcase in his cell with him. He was there for GBH times two or whatever the fuck it was. And um, he, he withered and died and fucked off on the roll, this cunt. And all that did was give me more kudos because people were coming up to me saying, do you know what, mate? Shake me around. You've got some balls on you. But before that happened... Well, the reason he went, we got a uh, screw come back. He goes, yeah, you got a solicitor's, a solicitor's come to see you and, and him. I said, fucking solicitor, what are you on about? Oh, no good to me now, I'm gone. He said, no, yeah, yeah, they're up there. So I went up there and this guy's up and said, come in, mate. And there's two of them in there. And they were pr met police prison intelligence. And he said to me, right, mate, um, I had all paperwork with him. He goes, listen, we've re received credible intelligence that your life is in serious danger and we need to move you on the roll. I said, fucking, I've got to go through this again. I said, listen, it is what it is. I said, you two, the pair of you put together are probably not even got as much service as I had. I said, and you're standing there telling me I'm old school. I said, listen, I've done what I've done. I'm not going on a rule with sex cases. I'm going to take my chances. And they said, what? I, mean, like, like, I was fucking mad. And I said, by the way, I'm out there as well. He's doing the same. He's not going on the rule. I think it was an Osborne warning they gave me. I've had them before. So I signed it, signed my life away and went fucked off back, you know, to me. And he came with me. And then after that, he fucking, I went out. I thought, I'm going to have to leave the cell. That's what happened then, because I remember now. So I thought, well, if I'm in danger, fucking, let's just take it. This cunt's no good to me. He's not going to do anything. He's not going to help me. So, uh, and then he, like I said, he folded, uh, and that helped me. And then when you're, when you're old being in prison, you're a fucking liability. You need to try and make yourself an asset. And the way I did it was I was, I was helping people with their legal paperwork, and people couldn't read or write. I was trying to help them write letters home and stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? Because once you start helping people, and then I realised, I started... Started, uh, I'm a prisoner there. These are my people, yeah? I'm not old Bill, I'm, 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 I'm an inmate. Um, and then I realised that a lot of these people never had any choices or chances in life. I did, and I fucked it up the wall. So it made me sort of humble to a degree to think, oh, I know you've done X, Y, Z, but do you know what? You, you come from an environment, you never had a fucking chance. I had loads of chances and I blew them all. And then that's why my mind started to work that, you know what? I've got to just, just do what I'm doing and, 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 uh, and understand and accept what I've done. Because if you never accept the shit you've done, you're never going to get past it. You know what I mean? Um, and, and that's what I tried to do. And I thought, you know what? When I get out of jail, I'm never going to tell, tell bollocks again. I'm just tell it straight. If I please or offend people, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. Just got to be true to yourself. Yeah, so a kid who was karate, British champion, yeah. to batter and nonces. yeah. To then work with the royal family, millionaire, millionaire. multi-millionaire, making yeah. money. To then fucking Turn over the place. To then in the jail, wanker, mate. Yeah. gambling addict. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's not like I say. Like, it's a very fascinating story, Paul. Like, mm. like it's it's your life, and 
you're not the only one who's fucked up and made plenty of mistakes. So see, did you survive that mm. prison sentence okay for a copper? Yeah, or yeah, was there no, many other scares I, I was, along the I was, way? I was, I was I was lucky because mm. I um I made I made friends with people and people was, as I said to you, I I I I help I tried to help people I and mean, I ended up in the fucking uh I had my own office doing rottles for people, you know, homelies. You know, and we all know the most important thing for a person is to get the fuck out of yeah, yeah. the family and your phone credit. Don't fuck with people's phone credit because that's when they're going to kick off. And, um, you know, and stuff like your canteen, isn't it? You know what I mean? And, and uh, right, so I worked in an office where I was helping people with their home leaves and, and speak liaising with the prison and all the rest of it to get people out, to get people home. So that gave me, um, you know, more, more respect, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. People started to forget what my job was. Do you know what I mean? They started to accept me as a person and the same with me where I used to catch these people. Now I'm I'm living with them. Do you know what I mean? And so it sort of changed to where I, I started getting to understand more about how people turn to crime and what happened. Whereas before you're in the police, it's them and us, isn't it? It's you and us. It's, that's how it is. Not really interested in your background story or interested in what you've done there. But then when you start to, as I say, listen to people, you think, fucking hell, you never had a chance and you're a clever person. You know, so a lot of clever people in there. Yeah. Um, art that could do art. I remember a boy and he, he said he'd been abused, um, you know, and that he turned to drugs and ended up doing crime and he couldn't hack it. And But it was it was an artist. He, he, he painted a, a Chelsea mural in his cell. And um, and the governor came around, I thought it was a new governor, one day he goes, now paint over that please, mate. It made him fucking paint over it. You think, but he's just done that. It was mentally, it was stimulating for this boy. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? He goes, oh, you're not allowed to, paint whatever but why would you just do that just then put fucking posters over it when he comes around next doesn't it do you know what I mean yeah. what's the worst thing you've seen in prison for I've a police seen, officer I've seen people shanked up I was talking to one fella one day and he seemed a normal person and he, someone walked past him from another gang uh, on uh, on road and he goes Paul two seconds mate he pulled out a shank and started stabbing the fuck out of this geezer and uh, I was like fuck and the screw the female screw looked the other way she didn't, didn't want to look and he fucked off, run off. I, mate, I was out there myself, but he got on, put on the block for a, a fucking month or so, and he come back, no, no charges, no nothing. Mm -hmm. I, was, I see someone get sliced open with a fucking the ch top of a tuna tin. Um, just sheer violence. I mean, uh, uh, someone got uh, jugged in there. A suspected sex case. Um, someone getting glass with a coffee mug and half his eye like that was hanging off. Um, it's brutal. You know, it's, it's fucking brutal. That's to certain mm. places. How's life like now? Yeah, I'm in. A, I'm in a better place. You know, every morning I still wake up with a bit of pill. You know, it's a bit of pill to swallow. What's happened to me? Um, but but I'm I'm doing all right. You know, I still think about the mistakes, you know, the, the bad decisions I made, not mistakes. Um, but as, the way I see it, right? I, I you know I started off with this interview telling you I did this in the place then you know, I bet sex case and all that and I, certain principles don't touch a police officer and all the rest of it you know I, the, some people that's wrong that's fine that's your opinion at the time I thought it was the right thing to do protect my colleagues um, protect the public from scumbags like these sort of individuals give them a bit of fucking payback you know all right vigilante thugging it whatever you want to call it but that's I can't change what I've done and I don't regret some of the things I've done um, but going into prison and as a police officer you're stripped of everything your dignity your fucking respect because you're now you're now the lowest of the low aren't you if you're a bent copper you're fucked up you know and now you're you're going where you deserve to be and I'm, I'm a firm believer that if you dish it out like I said to you you'd be, be prepared to take it don't stand in the dock and start fucking crying too late you've got to go and man up now and get into the big ass and survive if you put that uniform on you've got to act appropriate didn't you Mm -hmm. And if you don't, if you let the side down in any way, shape, or form, you've got to pay the consequences. Yeah. But in saying that, unless you're, if you're a sex case and they're not in a job, go fuck yourself. I hope you get kettled when you get put in jail. Right? That's the first thing. The second thing is if you've been corrupt and you've done stupidness or whatever else, um, you've got a small chance, a small window of opportunity if you go to prison to, to, to claw that some of that respect back and that dignity back, and that's never going the fucking rule with the sex cases and nonces. That's your only, that's your, it's a way to earn your colours to get back to some kind of normality. Do not go on the rule. It's as simple as that. I always said to people, a couple of people that have, that have been in this shit, I said, listen, shave your fucking hair off, put some weight on because you're going to lose weight when you go in there. And if it comes on top, you're going to have to smash your cell up or bang a screw out and get put on the fucking block. Do not go on the rule because once you do that, you've sold out the last ounce of dignity that you've got. Mm -hmm. What's the biggest regret you have? 
being a royal cop doing the doing the frog do it you know letting my colleagues down and my friends down and um uh, you know um do you regret it not saying anything to prince andrew being cheeky yeah do you know what it's the countless times we wanted to tell him to fuck off I and mean, a colleague of mine lost the plot and wanted to go and give him a clump but what 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 was going to happen since we get drummed out of the job kicked the you know, put on division whatever else if we'd have said anything back to him you know yeah you, it would have been you would have said it and you'd have been a hero for five minutes but then where are you going to be mm -hmm. yeah you can't say things you ended up in the jail anyway I ended up in <laughs> fucking jail anyway yeah I did I did I ended up in the clink anyway so fuck it where do you go forward for the future Paul um, right so I'm not one I don't want to be one of these people that are bouncing around the internet doing all these fucking interviews I'm doing a yeah. few I promised you I'd do yours yeah, two years you. ago do you know what I mean mm -hmm. and I keep my word and again on road all you got is your word if you've got nothing else you've got your word yeah, fuck all yeah you've got fuck all that's the only thing you've got um, and so I've done some TV stuff I'm looking at doing I've got some other TV stuff I, I'm, I'm looking at trying to come away from Prince Andrew you know what I mean I've said what I've said I don't want to be a broken fucking record mm -hmm. at the end of the day. People can either believe me or disbelieve me. I've been completely honest with you. Um, I, people, I've, I've, you know, I've read comments. They don't affect me. Yeah, I've been through jail. Yeah, I've been in ACAT. I, you know what I mean? I've been through all the prison system. So people's comments on the internet, I say to people out there, if you, you got, you're on Instagram, whatever you're on, don't, don't take to heart people's comments. There's fuck all. They're, they're spineless wankers who, who want to, you know, abuse you or whatever else. They're just fucking spineless. You know, I accept some of the comments that that are that put to me because I've 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 got a, what I've done I've done, so I have to go f have that sort of uh, people calling me a con man and a fucking liar and a thief and all the rest of it. I was a con man, I was a liar, I was a thief, but I'm not fucking now. There was a period of time I went through when I was all those things and worse, and I've come out the other end. Yeah, I understand what I've done. Um, you know, I'm not proud of it. I, you know, I've got to live with that for the rest of my life. But at the end of the fucking day, yeah, I'm moving forward, being honest, and everything that I've said about Prince Andrew is the truth, you know. And it, my colleagues are too frightened to come forward, yeah. So I'm the si mouthpiece for the silent majority, if, if that's what it is. I'm more than happy to have your colleagues on if they ever decide to come yeah, forward. Yeah, I mean, do, do you know what? There's a queue of people saying the same thing, including n news readers that are on the telly. I speak to, you know, I've, there's there's people I speak to in the media that that that's covertly slag off Prince Andrew but won't do it overtly because yeah. they'll lose their fucking jobs it's not just Prince Andrew it's people working in breakfast shows it's people who's yeah. worked in uh, yeah. big big fucking television shows that are yeah. still active today it's okay out in the people who's dead but it's the ones that are still alive who are, yeah. are naughty yeah. man, I mean so. I, my, my as I say at the end of the day <clears throat> I'm only interested in the protection and and, and um, sort of making sure the, the survivors are okay do you know what I mean? These individuals need locking up. Simple as I told you that before. They shouldn't be walking on walking on the cracks of the pavement. They should be fucking in jail. Mm -hmm. You know, we should concentrate on, on on the victims of domestic violence, the children, women that have been raped. I mean, these fucking pair of scumbags, cousins, and and the other fella. Um, you know, you say about bringing back the death penalty. Well, there's two ideal fucking candidates. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Um, and the Met Police, unfortunately, you know, even if one percent of the Met are, are corrupt, that's still three for uh, three hundred officers, is it, or whatever mm -hmm. it is. You know, it's a lot of police officers that are going to go through the system there. Yeah. Um, and it's not a good look for them. Um, Just before we finish up, yeah. did you ever come across anybody in prison that you'd put in prison? I fucking did. No yeah. way. Yeah, I did. Funny you should mention that. Yeah, I got to Stamford Hill and uh, like DCAT facility where I'm allowed to have home visits and all the rest of it. And uh, when I was in, when I was at Marylebone, <clears throat> this, this homeless fellow had murdered two other homeless people, like nasty, stabbed them up and cut cut their throats when they were asleep I think and um, anyway we got a call on the radio one night urgent assistance uh, such and such Jamie whatever his name was has been seen in Soho wherever, whatever, Greek Street where the fuck it was went down there and there's two coppers wrestling with this fucking thing this animal so we jumped out we, we, it was a massive fight it was great it was fucking mad was, we imagine he's killed two people he don't give a fuck and um, he took a, a took, he took a righteous clump because we had to fucking subdue him. Do you know what I mean? He took a proper clump um, just to get get him in cuffs and that. He was a dangerous individual. And he swifted him off. He got done for murder. Locked up 15 years later. He's walked past me in the fucking landing, hasn't he? But he wouldn't have remembered me anyway. I'm thinking, I'm oh, sure I know that geezer. He was, on his, he was on his last few years. He'd done it 15, 15 years. He'd done it more, whatever he'd done. Um, and now he was, he was uh, coming out, getting ready to come out. But it was still off key. It was still right, weren't right. I was thinking, fucking hell. 
that's when you realise. I was in there with lords as well, a couple of lords. And this is what fucks me off, right? So I'm in there with these two lords and an MP for expenses, yeah? And uh, one of them says to me, I've only been in fucking five minutes. I'm, I'm sitting in my office, dealing with all the rottles, all the homelies, with people have come into offer 10 year stretches, 15 year stretches, want to go home and sit their fucking family. This tit's only been in fucking two days. He's coming up to me going, uh, excuse me, I need a day out. I said, fucking what? You've only just been locked up. He goes, yeah, what it is, <clears throat> my man on my farm is going away and I need to go home. I've got really very rare chickens or pigs or something because I need to go and feed them. <laughs> and the fellow I was sat next to, he uh, was in for where he was in for. He goes, uh, uh, okay, let me explain to you. We don't give a fuck about you or your fucking chickens. Now, fuck off. <laughs> I said, oh, 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 oh. All right, so he's, he's fucked off. Then the other one's going, oh, I used to talk to him and uh, he was, I'm not going to identify him, but he was, he was, uh, he used to be a judge and all the rest of it. It was, it was, you know, whatever else. But so this is the attitude of these fucking people. And he's going to me, yeah, when I get out, I think I'm going to write a book. I said, I'm not being funny. You've only done fucking five minutes in jail. You haven't even put a dent in your fucking pillow. What the fuck are you going to write about? Right? He said, oh, oh, oh. So I go out to fucking no money, no fucking job. Yeah. He goes out to 300, they go back out to 350 pound a day in the House of Lords. How the fuck does that work? Yeah. Then they're sitting there. They're obviously dishonorable. They're, you know, they're same as me. You've committed a fraud. So you're untrustworthy. How the fuck are you sitting on, you know, passing laws. <laughs> you know what I mean? How does that work? That they go straight back out into the house laws. They're on three hundred and fifty pound a day. That's just, just this yeah, is the them really and us situation, isn't it? Yeah. I'm in the gutter, or rightly so. You know, I've got a bit pick myself up. But they go back to a life of luxury off the backs of the likes of us. It's a fucking mad. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, very interesting story. I've enjoyed this today. That like, would you like to finish up on anything? I'd just like to say, look. I said to James, I'm going to do this interview to highlight Embrace, Seavok, Child Victims of Crime. So if anything you've taken from this, don't fucking gamble. Don't do the stock market because it's just the devil's casino. Yeah. Don't, if anyone promises you something that doesn't seem realistic, it's probably a con. Do you know what I mean? Don't, don't get into that thing. And um, just please look at the charity. Um, and if you can put some money towards them, it's a good, it's a, you know, it'll, you'll be doing kids um you know a favor and, and it will help them as i say they're, they're affected indirectly or directly by crime uh either or is not a good thing for a child anyway yeah. do you know what i mean so it'd be really nice if people enjoyed this video i've been frank i've i've, I've kept nothing back like me or hate me just please look at the charity fair play for that i'll make sure i donate money to today yeah, thanks, i'll mate. leave you like in the description paul Sweet. listen Thank for you, coming mate. on here, mate, yeah, mate, i have enjoyed that it's an interesting yeah, cool. conversation yeah, it's been mate. a bit of everything yeah. i wish you nothing but best for the future brother yeah thank you take mate. care and god yeah. bless yeah and you mate yeah